Good evening. This time I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of May 9th, 2022. For viewers watching at home, commissioners and members of the public are participating via video conference and teleconference. Please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Buss? Present. Commissioner Lanson? Present. Commissioner Ling? Present. Commissioner McMahon? Present. Chair Newman? Present. Tonight we have with us Deputy Community, Community Development Director John Dugan. Mr. Dugan, are there any written comments, announcements, or continuances at this time? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. We have a supplemental packet that's been distributed to the Commission and posted containing written correspondence related to item 7B. Thank you, Mr. Dugan. And now is the time for public comment. At this time, any person may address the Commission regarding a city planning matter that is not on this evening's agenda. Should the Commission wish to discuss an issue, to discuss an issue raised by a member of the public, the issue will be referred to staff for scheduling on a future agenda. Anyone who would like to speak under public comments must click respect to speak on the agenda to, re to receive instructions before the public comments portion of the agenda is called. The speaker's remarks should be addressed to the commission as a whole and not to an individual com uh, commissioner or staff member. Unless otherwise provided by the commission, Speakers are limited to five minutes. The screen will show the remaining time you have. Madam Secretary, are there any public comments this evening? Yes, we have one. And I believe that's uh, Faisal Abbas. Yes. And... Uh, Chair, that person is not logged on on Zoom. Okay. We will try to come back at some point um, after one or more of our public hearings. Next, we'll move on to our consent calendar, which has the minutes of our March 14th, 2022 meeting. Are there any comments? Um, do any of my fellow commissioners have comments or a motion to approve the minutes? Before we go to motions, I want to note that I caught one typo and sent it to staff, which is that staff unwittingly or um, given Commissioner Buss a promotion, <laughs> um, the, the minutes should refer to Commissioner Buss as Commissioner Buss. Um, would that one correction or there, is there a motion or comments on, on the minutes? Sorry. <laughs> Commissioner uh, Lanson. No comments, I would move to approve the minutes. Any objections? Will the clerk please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. We now move to our public hearings. We have two tonight. We'll move to our first one, uh, item 7A. Will the clerk please open our public hearing? Agenda item 7A, hearing having been advertised as required by law. is hereby open to consider agenda item 7A, precise plan of design PPD 2022-70067 to allow a second story addition to an existing one story single family residence located at 87 Elex Drive. The applicants are Matthew and Michelle Lee. Thank you. And presenting on behalf of staff this evening is associate planner Will Chua. Good evening, Mr. Chua. Good evening, Excuse Chair Newman, Chair. members of the... Excuse me, oh. Mr. Chua. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, Mr. Chua. 
I'm sorry, I had forgotten. Um, Commissioner Link wishes to recuse for this matter. That is My correct. apologies, Mr. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Link. Yes, uh, I will be recusing myself so as not to prove, to have any bias as towards the decision of this commission. Thank, thank you for disclosing a possible conflict. And Commissioner Link will be leaving us for this hearing and will return for our next hearing. All right, apologies, I'd forgotten about Commissioner Link's recusal. Mr. Chua, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, Chair Newman, members of the commission. For your consideration tonight is a request to allow exemption from a single story restriction and a second story addition exceeding 50% of the original footprint for a two story addition to, a single, to an existing single story uh, uh, single family dwelling. The um, project site is the. Uh, this is the vicinity map showing that the uh, project is within the vicinity, the main arterial road of Borchard Road, and south of the 101 freeway. The uh, project is highlighted in red in the screen. To the north, northeast is the uh, Newberry Gateway Park, owned by the uh, and operated by uh, CRPD. Northwest side is the uh, common area for the tract, and to the west and south are single family dwelling re uh, residences. Um, the planning commission review is re necessary for this because the, requ the uh, request requires an addition exceeding 50% of the original building footprint and the uh, Planning Commission needs to review a modification to an existing condition that limited the uh, single story res the uh, residence to a uh, single story. The um, subject site is, a par is part of an 88 unit development approved by the City Council in 1976. During the uh, hearing of the uh, Planning Commission, certain residents on the south of the track expressed concern on the effect of the project on the hillside views. In uh, recommending approval to the City Council, the Planning Commission back then recommended with agreement from the developer to limit or restrict certain lots to single story only and that will be discussed later in the staff report. Uh, those lots are mostly located on the south side of Ilex Drive and includes three other lots, which includes this uh, subject property. This is the front view, fr uh, front view of the project. The uh, flag on top of the chimney represents the extent of the proposed addition, which is uh, 26 feet in uh, six inches in height. This is a view looking south from the front of the project site. From this picture, the residences on the adjoining tracks are barely visible, being blocked by the uh, residences and some uh, matured trees. The uh, project site is uh, designated as a residential in the um, land use land use um, in the uh, general plans a uh, land use element and zoned HPD. The uh, lot size is a little less than six, um, 7,000 square feet. The existing residence has 1,525 of habitable space and 462 square feet of garage. It currently has two bedroom and a two car garage. As mentioned earlier, it's bounded by a residential park and common area to this uh, tract. The uh, residences on the north side of Ilex are all two stories except this, uh, this, except the subject lot. And the residences on the south side of, of, the, uh, of Ilex Drive are all single stories. This shows the uh, front, right, rear, 
and left side elevations of the proposed project. The um, addition will add a small addition to the first floor of the property on the um, on your uh, right side of the screen is the uh, is the uh, first floor and the top of the screen is the addition where the uh, pointer mouse pointer is um, the uh, first floor addition will consist of renovation adding some adding a best uh, guest bedroom office and um, living room and storage and some bathrooms the second story the second floor is on the uh, left side of the screen. Uh, second floor addition consists of bedrooms, playroom, closets, bathrooms, and laundry room. This is a photo simulation of the proposed addition looking from the front of the property. This is a photo simulation for the rear of the uh, property. So the, um, during the uh, planning commission of 19, in 1976, when this project was being proposed, um, the residences to the south, which is um, uh, Seabury, which, um, which is on for residences on Seabury Court, they showed up at the Planning Commission hearing, and at the Planning Commission hearing, the Planning Commission, with the agreement of the um, um, developer, limited certain lots to single story only because of the concern of the hillside view. The highlighted part is the uh, single is the uh, project site, lots one. 1259 through lot 82 were all limited to single story. Now, um, the all the all the um, lots on the side side of south side of Ilex are single stories, and all the lots all the uh, residences on the north side of Ilex are all two story, except this particular the subject lot um, this restriction may have been added because the um, lot along with lot 12 were both next to an open space area that goes hill up hillside so there may have been a concern about the um, silhouetting or view being exposed from either borchard or michael drive This is a uh, street view of the street along Ilex Drive. The residences on the left, on the right, are all two stories, which are the which is the south side of Ilex. The residences on the left side are all on the which is the north side are all single story. This is another view of the uh, street view from uh, Ilex Drive of single-story homes and two-story homes. This is a view of the open space adjacent to the uh, subject property, which is, uh, this open space is part of the uh, Gateway Park. This is a view from the front of the property, looking south, where, as you can see, that you know there, the houses on the other side are barely visible, except for maybe this single-family home here, in between those two uh, houses. The um, city's precise plan of design guidelines is what staff use to evaluate residential, institutional, and industrial projects. The intent is, is to ensure that the project's design features and elements are compatible with the existing natural and man-made uh, surroundings. The uh, project has an architectural style that is consistent with the neighborhood, along with, um, um, and in addition, the, it also has materials, colors that are consistent with the neighborhood as well. 
The addition, as mentioned earlier, will consist of is consist of renovation and small addition on the first floor, four bedrooms, playroom, uh, laundry room, etc. On the second floor, um, there will be a total floor addition of 1,033 square feet on the second floor, which is about 58 percent of the existing footprint of the house. The uh, total proposed habitable area will be. Uh, 2668 square feet. This is a comparison of the house sizes with other surrounding with the houses in the uh, vicinity. These are all mostly compared to uh, two-story homes for better comparison. The um, the as you can see the uh, floor to area ratio is within pretty much 10% of the average except for one that has a uh, floor to area ratio of only uh, 40 percent but the rest of them is probably within about five percent five to seven percent <clears throat> the uh, project qualifies for the uh, common sense and class one exemptions since for the following reason it can be seen with certainty that the uh, project will have no significant effect on the environment and that the addition involves expansion to a private structure with no expansion of use beyond that what is existing at present time. In conclusion, staff de determined that the proposed project is consistent with the overall architectural theme established in the project's vicinity, consistent with the precise plan of design intent and purpose. The uh, condition of which the single story limitation was imposed back in 1976 no longer exists because the views back then, the views, the clear views back then were now blocked by the uh, intervening or the new single story homes that were built on the side side, on the south side of Ilex Drive. The uh, project will not result in a dwelling that would be out of character with the neighborhood and will not over intensify the development of the uh, project. And with that, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the sequel findings and PPD 22-70067 based on the findings and the subject con to the conditions of approval in the uh, resolution attached to the staff report. Now, uh, a little bit of uh, House cleaning staff would like to uh, revise condition number two of the um, resolution, which I will read and quote. Um, scope of permit approval. The precise plan of design is granted to modify condition number 22B of HPD 76-5 to remove the single story limitation to the subject lot, which is lot, I mean, uh, open plain, lot 59 of track 2503, and the construction of a second story addition exceeding 50% of the original building footprint, which shall be constructed sus substantially as indicated on the sub submitted pl uh, project plans dated January 26, 2022. And with that, staff is available to answer questions from the commissioner. Thanks very much, Mr. Chua. Are there questions or comments of staff from commissioners? Commissioner Lanson, I saw your hand first. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, Mr. Chua, thank you for your report. Just a few quick questions. Uh, I noticed uh, exhibit six, I believe, was um, phrased as a petition, um, but essentially it was a signature of 22 homeowners, I believe, that were, or residents that were in favor of the application. Uh, did you receive any uh, comments from anybody in, in, in objection to this application? No, I did not. Uh, and my second question was uh, the reference to this was initially designated single story. It sounds like from what you're saying, we don't know why specifically it was ever specifically designated as single story. <laughs> Um, th that, that's true because um, lot number one on the corner of Karub and, um, and Borchard Road is now a two-story. And then the only 
two uh, the, the only um, single story right now that's part of those lot I mean part of those three that were included were this lot and the one at the end of yield drive and and from your evaluation there'd be no reason to maintain that that requirement based on the, that kind of uh, construction? there's no I mean this is like okay let, let me um, make this clear that this exemption does not mean that future exemption will be granted to the rest of the uh, properties on the south side be this is an exemption because we evaluated this project and based on staff's analysis we've went through um, we've driven through um, borchard road michael drive since this is adjacent to all open space and we want to make sure that there will be no silhouetting or that this project has the ability to impede anybody's view of the hillside. And I'm assuming that's so, why you did the uh, superimpose what the structure would look like on the actual house to show us what it actually would look like. Would yes. Be? Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Buzz. I just have one question. Um, the reference to the uh, second story being 58% of the footprint of the first story. If this was 150 square feet smaller, would it be in front of us right now? Um, could be, yes. It would still be in front of us because of the Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because, okay. because, of the, uh, because of the request for the exemption to the condition that was recommended. Okay. I just want to confirm that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other commissioner questions or comments of staff? Hearing none, we will move to our applicant who is represented tonight by Mr. Tom Cohen, attorney for the applicants, the Lees. Good evening, Mr. Cohen. And you will have up to 15 minutes, divide however you like uh, for your comments. Good evening. Is this on? It is now. Okay, there we go. Uh, my name is Tom Cohen. I'm the applicant family's representative this evening. And let me just tell you, it is uh, uh, exciting to be here. I have <laughs> not had an opportunity to present live in quite some time. Uh, first order of business is I want to thank uh, staff, uh, Will Chua in particular, and Steve Kearns for uh, their efforts in guiding us through this entitlement process. Uh, tonight with me uh, is Matthew Lee, uh, husband to Michelle Lee. Michelle is on Zoom and uh, available to share her thoughts. Uh, they're the owners of this home along with their two young children. Uh, and I'm gonna have Matt uh, talk to you this evening as well, share a little story about uh, uh, this home and we're here before you uh, this evening due to this project condition that you've heard uh, that was approved back in 1976 um, and my understanding was that there were some neighbor concerns about uh, how this uh, this subdivision would impact views from those homes to the south uh, uh, and uh, subsequently led to this uh, single story restriction uh, I'll come back to that. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Lees. Uh, they're, they're a young family. Uh, they're finding themselves uh, in a very difficult housing market. Uh, their family is growing. They have very limited room in their home today to adequately house everyone. Uh, and as you all know, it's a, it's a limited and expensive housing market. And now with interest rates rising, things become even more uncertain. So the, the, the answer for Michelle and Matthew uh, was to enlarge their home uh, to accommodate this growing family and by doing so uh, in a way that would not disrupt uh, their neighborhood and de then designing something that's consistent with the other homes in their neighborhood. And I think you've heard from staff that this house does uh, meet the consistency requirements. Um, I, I got a little uh, 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 with with Mr. Bus. Um, you know, why are we here before you? And and it, the 150 square feet is partly that reason, but it's really this restriction that's been here for 46 years. 
My advice when I met um, Michelle and Matthew was to talk to their neighbors, uh, canvas them, make sure that the neighborhood was, was comfortable with their plan to add this second story. And so far as we know, not one neighbor has registered any concern or issue. Um, and in fact, there are some neighbors here this evening that will, will, will be talking and sharing their support. In addition, the, the uh, Homeowners Association Board of Directors uh, granted approval as well. Uh, last, what was certainly not the case 46 years ago in a new subdivision, there have been a lot of trees planted. As, as you know, that's a big requirement here in Thousand Oaks, and these trees have matured. And they've done a wonderful job of screening the area, including the Lee's homes from the southeast. Thus, in our opinion, the value uh, of the single story uh, restriction is no longer uh, relevant. I uh, uh, would ask that you um, support this application. Um, and at this time, I'll ask uh, Matthew Lee to join me and uh, provide his, his testimony this evening. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll, of course, be available to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Good evening, Mr. Lee. If you could, for the record, please state your name and city of residence. Sure, Matthew Lee. Uh, is it okay with the mask on? Just... It's fine. Okay, perfect. Matthew Lee, uh, Newberry Park. Um, good evening, all. Uh, 1984 might not be a memorable year for everyone. However, in our case, it's where our story begins at ILAC. Thousand Oaks has always been a place where we've created memories. My grandparents moved here in 1984 from the cold climate of Philadelphia to sunny Thousand Oaks. The reason? To be close to their grandson, Matthew. That's me. <clears throat> My grandparents found a single family home located at 87 Ilex and lived there in the same house until their passing in 2012 and 2014. The house was part of my childhood. So many great memories there. So many great stories. I could be here all night telling stories about the house and my grandparents. My parents moved to Thousand Oaks in 1989. I grew up here. I went through the public school system from elementary, middle, high school, community college. I even graduated locally at the university. My wife grew up here. She went to middle and high school. We got married here in Thousand Oaks. We've started our family and we're continuing to raise our children here. We love it here. We've watched how the city has changed and continues to grow. You know, as Tom was saying, our, our home is running out of space. You know, our family's growing. We need a little bit more space. And we fall under the situation that we're priced out of the local housing market. You know, the housing market's crazy right now, as everyone's well aware. So we had to try to figure something out. You know, the housing market's not going to work in our favor, so we looked for something more financially suitable, and this is why we're here tonight. By the additional bedrooms, we will have space to house our family and even a place for a family member to stay. As everyone's aware, the workforce has changed over the past couple of years where there's a need to have a home office, a, home, a room where mental dis distinction between work functions can be separated from personal functions. Our neighborhood is our extended family. They're here tonight. They're here via Zoom. They're here in this room. We have a diverse community that's very social and very supportive. We have movie nights where we watch movies out in the driveway. We have neighborhood get-togethers. Our neighborhoods are family. When we first met with our architect, we came up with a design. We wanted to be least impactful to the homes around us. We have shared our plans with our neighbors. We have, <clears throat> we have received their signature for approval and support of our addition. We went around, we got 20 signatures from our close neighbors, which by the warm reaction, the plans mean that our goal was successful. 87 Ilex is more than a home. It is a place full of memories and stories. It is our Zen. It's our place where we can rest and relax, a place where we can gather as a family and tell stories of the past and make memories of the future. 
It's a place where we can grow together and be together with close family and friends. And lastly, I just want to say thank you for all your time. Mr. Lee, thanks very much for your comments. Commissioners, are there any questions or comments for the applicant? Not hearing any, we will move to public comments. We have, um, if I'm counting right, let's see, I think three, but I think it's actually more than that. One moment, please. I think we have five public speakers, so that means each of you will have up to five minutes to speak. Um, I'll call the person who's, who's up and then the next person after that. Um, and we ask that you state your name and your city of residence. We'll start with Jill Minor and then follow up with Chad Minor. Jill Minor. Okay, and, and sir, if you could state your name and city of residence, and then you have five minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chad Miner, and I'm speaking on behalf of my wife, Jill Miner. We're from Newbury Park. Uh, Matt and Michelle are my next door neighbors. So I've known them since they've moved in and enjoyed their wonderful family fully supportive of the plans that they have going forth. Uh, Matt has disclosed to me what it's gonna look like and how long it's gonna take and all those kind of things. So we're just here in support of that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of this speaker? Okay, we'll move on next to uh, Michelle Grimaldi followed by Lou Papera and Jill Steiner. Ms. Grimaldi, good evening. Hello, my name is Michelle Grimaldi. I also live in Newberry Park since 1986. 36 years at the same house. I've raised four kids there. Matt used to play with my kids growing up. I know, I'm the old lady on the block now. How did this happen? Um, and I knew his, his grandparents very well. Um, I'm here to support them. When you look at where uh, his house is located, it's at the end of the cul-de-sac, and I can't figure out why anybody thought that would restrict a view. When I, if anybody knows the neighborhood, it's me, right? And also the fact that because we're zero lot lines, there's no, um, no view over into the other side. So all the restrictions that the Homeowners Association might put on it have been met. Um, you know, I just, I really urge you to really consider this, this addition. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of this speaker? Okay, very good. We'll move on to Michelle. I'm sorry, you were Michelle Grimaldi. Uh, we'll move on to Lou Papera and Jill Steiner. Lou Papera. Hello, I'm Lou Papera. I live at 87, I, or 67 Ilex, same street. I'm also the president of the HOA and we've been here for 30 years in our house and we love Matt and Michelle and uh, I think the project would add aesthetically to the neighborhood uh, as well as to the value of the, the track itself and the HOA and they've been stellar neighbors and um, we all voted on the board and we're all in favor of the project and we have no objections. And I, I hope you would approve their uh, request. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Papera. Any questions? We'll move on to our final public speaker, which is Jill Steiner. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jill Steiner. I actually live right across the street from Matt and Michelle. Um, my house was in a lot of those photos that you saw. Um, I can really relate to where Matt and Michelle are right now. Um, I have a young family as well, and we work at home. And about four years ago, we also did an, an addition on our house. We were able to go um, out and not up, but um, having the same floor plan as them, I really, I understand where they're at. I understand with having the kids and having family come to visit and having to work from home, the space that's now needed. And, and so um, they've been, 
you know, we live in a, in a great neighborhood. Um, when he says it's a family, it is absolutely our little village. Um, and we would hate to um, see them not be able to stay because they can't um, do what they need to with the house. So um, as somebody who looks at their house outside of my rent front window every day, we um, have absolutely no objection for it to become a two story. Thank you, Ms. Steiner. Commissioners, any questions? All right, very good. Thank you to all the public speakers. We now go back to staff for follow-up comments. Mr. Chua? Um, staff has no follow-up comment. Very good. And we go back then to the applicant who is signaling that they do not wish to rebut any comments. <laughs> very good. Commissioners, are there any final comments or questions of staff or the applicant? Hearing none, I will go ahead and close the public hearing and entertain comments or a motion. I see Commissioner Lanson's hand first. Thank you, Speedy Chair. Speedy hand. Thank you, Chair Newman. Um, in this day and age, uh, there's so many things and, and people are concerned about our community. I have to say this is one of the most heartwarming applications I think I've seen in a long time from uh, people who are, are the, the heart of our city, who've been here for so long, to doing a great presentation, by the way. Uh, you should teach, by the way, how to do presentations, by the way, Mr. Lee, you did a great job. Uh, to great council, kind of going through the issues, to getting community support, getting the HOA support. Uh, it's just a heartwarming process to see our community come together in an issue like that to help people and work things forward. Um, I don't see of a reason why not to, to go forward with this, so I'm gonna go ahead and make the motion to adopt the resolution approving PPD 2022 dash 70067 for the second story addition, subject to the findings and conditions in the resolution, and I think the rev revision of item two that Mr. Chu yes. indicated. Thank you. Commissioner Buss. Well, Commissioner Lanson stole my thunder. I was so excited about this presentation. I've been on the, the board for a little while, and uh, this has got to be one of the most fun presentations I've had. I'm sure Mr. Cohen can agree, <laughs> representing the applicant. Um, I love the fact that so many of your neighbors came out in support of you. Uh, it's, it's tough to fill the softball team in this town, and you got all these people to show up on your behalf. Uh, I, I, I can't be more excited to vote about a project than this one, so thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McMahon. Hello, um, three things stand out to me. Number one, Mr. Chua has said that the conditions that existed before to restrict it to a one story don't exist anymore. <clears throat> Excuse number two, all the other homes on that side of the street are two story. That just seems unfair <laughs> to me. And uh, number three, uh, it, the plans for it will conform to the neighborhood. So to me, it's a slam dunk. Yes, that's all. Thank you, Commissioner. I concur with all my fellow commissioners that this is a universally positive hearing. We're very happy to have that. We often hear cases that have controversy, that have fine shades of gray, and that's what we're here for is to, is to make um, judgment calls, sometimes tough judgment calls, but this is a really easy one, so thank you for that. Um, I'm also going to support the resolution for that. And with that, I'll ask the clerk to prepare the commission for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. <coughs> Motion carries 4-0, Commissioner Link is recused. Thank you. And Mr. Lee, um, before you go, I want to I want to thank you for um, marshalling all the support. You're obviously loved in your community. Um, we're really happy that you're able to stay in Thousand Oaks. And thank you for putting together your team. Thank you for staying here. We appreciate it. I see Commissioner Link coming back to the dais. We'll just wait one quick minute. Oh, yeah. Yes, and this is this is a uh, possibly appealable case. If, if any aggrieved party wishes to file an appeal, you may do so within 10 days by filing a notice to appeal with the Community Development Department. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to come back to public comments. I understand that uh, Faisal Abbas is on the line with us now, and Mr. Abbas has, or Ms. Abbas, I'm not sure, has a comment um, not on the agenda. So please go ahead. You have five minutes. Are you with us? Um, you may need to unmute. Chair, that person is logged on, but they need to unmute themselves. Okay, please be sure you unmute. I did it myself all the time when we were remote. <laughs> Faisal Abbas, are you with us? Chair, unfortunately, they are still muted. Okay, we'll try one more time and then we'll move on. Faisal Abbas, please unmute yourself. Any better? Or can, do we hear each other? Still if I, muted. If I may, Chair? Yes. Excuse me. I believe that gentleman is with uh, one of the, uh, either the applicant or the appellant for the next hearing. Okay, then that would not be a public comment and we will come back to them during the next public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll move to that next public hearing if the clerk would open that, please. Hearing having been advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 7B, Appeal of Development Permit DP 2021-70408 and Protected Tree Permit PTP 2022-70370. Appellant is requesting the Planning Commission reverse the administrative decision approving Development Permit DP 2021-70408, thereby denying the request to approve a new 21,440 square foot waste collection truck dispatch center with outdoor vehicle storage, maintenance facilities, associated parking, retaining walls, and a compressed national natural gas CNG fueling station. The applicant is requesting that the Planning Commission approve development permit DP 2021-70408 and protected tree permit PTP 2022-70370 to allow removal of one oak tree involving a multi-trunk, 24-inch, 12-inch, and 11-inch diameter, Coast Live Oak at the entrance of the property at 2550 Conejo Center Drive if the above request is denied in order to comply with the required conditions of approval and the plan that the Planning Commission find that the project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to Section 15332. This is located at 2498 and 2550 Conejo Center Drive, a vacant lot south of Conejo Center Drive, west of Lawrence Drive, east of Private Driveway, APN 667-0-080-015 and 667-0-080-035. The appellant is GI Industries uh, DBA Waste Management and the applicant is ARC Investment Group. Thank you. And presenting for staff this evening is Associate Planner Justine Kendall. Ms. Kendall, good evening. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, uh, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Um, as you just heard, there are two requests tonight, um, one from the appellant and one from the applicant. I will address each request in somewhat reverse order. I'll go through the first, the project and property history, the setting, and review the proposed scope of work, including the protected tree permit, after which I'll summarize the sequel review process and then go through the details of the appeal. The project was submitted to the city on July 2nd of last year. On February 3rd, a notice of the application was mailed to all property owners within 500 feet of the project site, in addition to all known interested parties, and a sign was posted on the property. Subsequently, staff received four letters requesting an administrative hearing, which was held on March 24th of this year. The administrative hearing officer, having considered all submitted correspondence and testimony presented at the meeting, concluded that the proposed project is consistent with city standards, codes, and policies. 
The subject appeal was then submitted on April 4th and the notice of hearing for this meeting published and posted on April 25th. The project site within, is within uh, the Rancho Conejo specific plan, also known as specific plan number seven, and is located at 2498 and 2550 Conejo Center Drive. As you can see here, the elevation of the property is slightly higher than the adjacent roadway. ARC Investments is proposing to improve only a portion of the site outlined roughly here in yellow involving a proposed disturbance footprint of 4.42 acres. The site is currently vacant, but was previously graded during the development of the tract. It is accessed by an existing driveway uh, via Conejo Center Drive. The project area is designated as industrial in the Thousand Oaks General Plan and is zoned industrial park or M1. The subject property is surrounded by developed industrial properties. Parcels immediately adjacent to the project site to the north, east, and south are also designated as industrial and zoned M1. Parcels to the west are designated industrial and open space, while they are zoned uh, residential plan development. The nearest residential uses are approximately 1,000 feet to the southwest. The existing roads, topography, and industrial uses do form a buffer between the proposed project and all nearby residential uses. The project site is, as I said, currently undeveloped, but was previously graded as part of the tract uh, development, tract 4823. The subject property is also known as planning unit D of specific plan number seven, which was approved by the city in December 1983. In January 1988, the subject property was reserved for the Conejo Valley Unified School District, uh, the previous owners of the property, to use as a maintenance and bus storage facility. 17 years later, in January 2015, General Planned Use Amendment uh, number 2014-70052 and uh, the Specific Plan Amendment number 15 was approved to rezone the subject property from institutional to industrial after the school district decided to sell this property to offset the cost of relocating the existing operations and maintenance facility to a different site. The project before you this evening will establish a site for storage, maintenance, fueling, and operation of a waste collection truck fleet with supporting offices. The project will involve about 42 truck operators and 13 on-site employees, resulting in about 55 on-site employees traveling to and from the site. The hours of truck operation will be from 4 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on-site maintenance will operate from around 4 a.m. to 12 a.m. with 24-hour security. Athens Services, the operator, plans to commence commercial or residential routes between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. and complete all routes prior to 7 p.m. The other on-site truck operations include activities such as the arrival of employees, drivers and office dispatch employees, and the fueling of trucks. In addition, the applicant is proposing to remove uh, one protected oak, tr oak tree in order to comply with condition of approval included in the administrative, administrative approval of the development permit. The tree removal is required to widen the existing unpaved driveway from 20 to 40 feet. As uh, previously stated, the primary use of the proposed development is to store waste collection vehicles, which falls under the category of contractor storage yards and allowed use in the M1 zone with the approval of a development permit per the municipal code's permitted use matrix. As you can see circled in yellow, uh, 60 parking spaces are provided for automobile use as required by the municipal code. The re remaining spaces you see here are the 61 truck storage spaces provided. However, it's important to note that the project is only expected to store approximately 42 trucks at any given time. All waste collection trucks stored on site will be empty of refuse and waste and will not be stored on site at any time as proposed and required by the conditions of, of approval. The concept is designed to utilize and augment the existing building pad and driveway alignment and to avoid additional site disruption. Grading of the 4.42 acre project site will involve cut and fill resulting in a net 28 cubic yards of export. Retaining walls seen here in green 
are proposed along the eastern half of the northern edge of the graded pad at the southwest corner of the project area and east of the driveway entrance. The proposed 21,440 square foot structure includes a 13,440 square foot maintenance building and an adjacent 8,000 square foot building, seen here outlined in blue, for an office, dispatch, parts, and customer service. In the M1 zone, buildings and accessory structures are limited to a height of 35 feet, and the proposed building has a maximum height of 31.5 feet. The proposed building is uh, design is compatible with other industrial development within the project vicinity. Private outdoor space, including uh, an outdoor seating area for employee use, are proposed. <clears throat> Although the storage area and structures will only be minimally visible from public roads and existing adjacent uses, preservation of existing landscaping, perimeter fencing, and new landscaping are required and would further shield the project from view. An oak tree an oak tree report prepared on behalf of the applicant uh, was provided in September 2021. The report stated that there are 40 to 50 coast live oak trees on site and concluded that none of the 11 living oak trees previously planted uh, would be negatively impacted by the project. Uh, following uh, evaluation of the report and project details, um, that was found to be an error and it was determined that one mature oak tree uh, oak tree number seven, which you can see here in the top left, would be impacted by the proposed expansion of the driveway. Uh, oak, tre or oak tree number 77 um, is, was originally planted as required by the original oak tree report for the development of the tract. The project site plan proposes to pave and widen the existing dirt driveway to provide sufficient width to allow two-way access to the proposed development. Based on the Arborist Report's applicant testimony and the site, constraint, uh, site constraints, neither realigning nor narrowing the driveway is feasible. Um, therefore, the Type D oak tree permit is requested and before you tonight. The landscape plan proposes a total of 91 new trees, which greatly exceeds the city's tree planting standard, um, and 34 of those trees are to be oak trees. Four of the 34 will be 36 inch, bo inch box trees and the remaining 30 will be planted as 24 inch box trees. The required replacement rate is only three. Uh, clearly that is very much exceeded in this case. <clears throat> Following review of the project and technical studies, it was determined that the project qualifies as a class 32 categorical exemption under section 15332. The findings required to exempt the project include that the project is consistent with the applicable general plan designation and all applicable general plan policies as well as with the zoning designation and regulations. The project is less than five acres and surrounded by existing industrial uses. Per a biological resource assessment, which was peer reviewed as well, the project will not impact any environmentally sensitive resources as the subject area has no value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. Per noise, traffic, and air quality studies, the project would not result in any significant effects relating to traffic, noise, air quality, or water quality, and the site is already served by required utilities and public services. Furthermore, none of the conditions listed uh, as exceptions to the exemptions are pertinent to this project as the project will not result in cumulative impacts detrimental to the environment. The site does not involve any unusual circumstances requiring further environmental study. The site is not within view of a state scenic highway, nor does the site contain any hazardous material or impact a scenic resource. The appeal before you today was submitted by Waste Management with the following stated as the grounds for the appeal. One, that the environmental review of the project is required under CEQA, and two, that the findings made by the administrative hearing officer lack substantial evidence and support. The first statement is reinforced with four main categories of issues brought forth by the appellant. Uh, exceptions to the exemptions, exemption findings, project scope, and noticing requirements. Staff carefully reviewed the statements and supporting documents submitted by the appellant, and uh, I'll now break out each of those in more details, uh, more detail with our response. 
Part of the appellant's comment letter provided on the day of the administrative hearing, which is included in their appeal, states that the Class 32 exemption is not applicable because two of the exceptions which preclude determining a project exempt um, apply. One, that the property has value as a habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species, and two, uh, because it is located within a very high fire hazard severity zone, um, which the appellant says, uh, posits that is an unusual condition. However, uh, as I said, a biological resource assessment was prepared as part of the CEQA evaluation, a renaissance, uh, renaissance, re reconnaissance level biological assessment of the entire subject property, including the project site specifically, was conducted on November 19th, 2021 to identify those areas that could potentially contain sensitive biological resources. The assessment involved a search for habitat uh, for endangered, rare, or threatened species. None of these species were found to be within the survey area, and no native plants or vegetation community occur within the project site. The assessment found that the site is highly disturbed and lacks natural vegetative habitats to support endangered, rare, or threatened species, and concluded that there is no potential for special status species or wildlife to occur within the project site. Therefore, the, the site does not provide value as habitat for those types of species. In terms of impacts related to wildfire, a significant uh, proportion of, of the city of Thousand Oaks and of course the region generally is designated as being within a very high fire hazard severity zone. You can see here in red the areas of the city which are designated um, it, as being within that zone. There is no prohibition against the application of categorical exemptions within this zone which do not present an unusual circumstance. Projects on properties designated as being within a very high fire hazard severity zone are regularly determined to be exempt. Like any project proposed within such a zone, the project structures are required to meet hazardous fire area building code requirements and are subject to fire department requirements such as sprinklers, hydrants, fire lanes, and access requirements. Prior to obtaining a building permit for any new structures, the project would be required to submit a Ventura County Fire Department form uh, an application for their review. Such requirements have been and would be put on any development proposed within this area. Concern was specifically raised about the compressed natural gas or CNG fueling station proposed and the potential effects on future emergency evacuations. CNG stations are a common piece of energy infrastructure and are installed throughout California for commercial vehicle operations, including one at the city's fleet service yard less than a mile away. That CNG station has operated safely for more than 20 years. The proposed CNG fueling station will be designed with safety mechanisms to meet modern building codes and safety requirements, including automatic shutoffs as required by law. Related to their argument that the project should not be exempt is a statement that several conditions approved by the administrative hearing officer equate to de facto mitigation measures, indicating that the project would present a negative impact on the environment. However, the conditions of approval mentioned by the appellant, including the conditions listed here, are standard conditions applied to nearly every entitlement of this type and are not intended to imply mitigation of a project-specific adverse impact. In general, the conditions of approval ensure that the actual construction and operation of the project remain consistent with the design and use proposed. The exception here is condition 27, which does not apply uh, in this case, uh, as the biological resources assessment determined that there was no potential for specific, or sorry, special status wildlife to occur on site. As such, um, we request that that condition be removed from the resolution, and that is how it's been uh, proposed to you tonight. Uh, moving now to that second category that I mentioned uh, as part of their appeal statement, uh, their first appeal statement, the appellant states that the project would not meet condition A of the exemption required under CEQA guidelines section 15332 as the exemption would conflict with general plan policy CO32. However, as mentioned previously, as part of the CEQA evaluation, the biological resource assessment concluded, again, that the site lacks natural vegetative habitats to support endangered, rare, or threatened species. There is no potential for special status plants or wildlife to occur within the project site, and the site does not provide value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. Therefore, the policy stated above does not apply to the proposed project. 
The appellant also states that the class 32 exemption condition D, highlighted here, can not be met because the administrative hearing staff report lacks substantial evidence supporting the conclusion that the project will not result in significant vehicle miles traveled, otherwise known as VMT, impacts. However, it should be noted that for the purposes of traffic impact analysis, the VMT of heavy duty trucks, such as waste hauling trucks, uh, need not be analyzed. Regardless, city staff has considered both automobile and heavy duty truck trips and determined that even when taken together, project generated VMT does not result in a potentially significant traffic impact. The city's VMT analysis for CEQA compliance policy adopted by the city council in July 2020 requires a VMT study when a proposed project is projected to generate more than 100 p.m. peak hour trips. Since the proposed project is projected to generate only 48 p.m. trips, a VMT study is not required. The traffic impact analysis indicates that the project will generate 194 average daily trips with 92 a.m. peak hour trips and again 48 p.m. peak hour trips. The number of p.m. peak hour trips is below the policy's minimum screening criteria of 100 uh, peak hour trips or more. Therefore, this project will have a less than significant impact related to transportation. The appellant maintains that the position that the project is proposed uh, is a consequence of the exclusive franchise agreement and both the agreement and the subject project should be analyzed under CEQA as one project. However, as the award of the franchise and this project are completely separate, a standalone environmental analysis for the project is reasonable and appropriate. When the City Council awarded the franchise agreement to Athens in March 2021, there was no need to contemplate the subject parcel as a possible location for storing Athens' truck fleet. Athens' proposal did not require that the company develop a storage facility at Conejo Center Drive or any specific location. In addition, Athens is already fulfilling its contractual duties under the franchise agreement without the use of the subject site. The decision to award the franchise agreement and any decision to evaluate a development permit application for a storage facility are completely separate matters. The appellant also states that the city's public agenda and notice of the March 24th, 2022 hearing violates the Brown Act by not including the recommended reliance on the Class 32 CEQA exemption. However, the purpose of the administrative hearing uh, was not to ask the administrative hearing officer to adopt a document, but rather to review the decision of the community development director and revise conditions of approval as necessary. Finding the project exempt from CEQA was not an action required to be requested at that meeting. However, the subject appeal before you tonight is a de novo hearing and finding the project exempt from CEQA is a request included in the resolution before the planning commission. As such, the request has been included also in the agenda and all public notices properly posted. Lastly, the appellant states that the findings made by the administrative hearing officer lack substantial evidence and support. The appellant claims that Athens Services is currently storing waste in its vehicles overnight at the facility presently in use outside of the city. However, regardless of operational procedures which may or may not be in use at other locations, the proposed storage of vehicles on the project site is contingent upon said vehicles being free of refuse as stated in condition 60 of the resolution before the planning commission. It is not considered a mitigation measure as it has been a stated operational procedure from the project submittal. Should this condition be violated in the future, the city would take reasonable measures to address any alleged violation with the applicant. In conclusion, it is staff's recommendation to deny the appeal, find the project categorically exempt from CEQA, approve the project based on the staff report findings and subject to the conditions of approval in the attached resolution. I would like to note that the resolution contains conditions which have been updated slightly from those approved by the administrative hearing officer to remove what was condition number 27, as it does not apply to this project, and include standard conditions related to the protected tree permit. I, as well as other city staff, uh, the appellant and applicant teams are available for questions and clarification. Thank you, Ms. Kendall, for your report. Commissioners, are there questions or comments of staff? Commissioner McMahon. Yes, hi. I, I wanted to um, understand the situation with oak tree number 77. Um, usually when there's an oak tree that needs to be moved, 
one of this size, it comes straight to the Planning Commission. Had there not been an error on that oak tree report, would it have had the administrative hearing first as it did, or would it have come straight to us? It would have come straight to you. Okay, so um, and my, um, my next question is, will the city be conducting periodic inspections to see that their, their uh, trucks are empty and they're complying with all the, the conditions? We will not be doing the periodic inspections of the site. It will be based on uh, receiving a complaint and a formal investigation at that point. Okay. And um, just, uh, this is probably for the applicant, um, but I was wondering, there are a couple of offices on this site. Will those be for the public to come in and pay their bill or have customer service questions or complaints? Do you know? I'll let the applicant team address that when they give their comments. I don't believe so. I believe every, all uses on the site are to be private use for the operator. Okay, thank you. That's all for now. Thank you. Other questions of staff? Commissioner Buzz. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Ms. Kendall. Um, I just got one question. Um, I didn't notice it when I read the presentation earlier, but when I saw it on the screen in front of me, the administrative decision was on March 24th, and the uh, appeal was on April 4th. That's 11 days. Is that beyond the scope of an appeal period? Because I, I believe ours is 10 days. I think the 10 days was landed on a Sunday, so we put it to Monday. Copy that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, so the, the trucks that are currently being used in Thousand Oaks are stored in Sun Valley? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kendall, I too thank you for your report. I just have one question about the replacement trees. You mentioned um, 34 oaks and 91 new trees in total. Those new oaks that are going in, are they protected species such as coast live oak? I don't think we have a specific species uh, required or proposed, although we could add that to the resolution. Okay, I mean, Just, uh, these are our, our two heritage trees here. Uh, Mr. Heer is raising his hand. Yeah, if I, if I can just augment Kearns. the comment. Um, all yes. genus Quercus are protected in the city of Thousand Oaks, not just the coast and the valley oak, but um, they'll be all genus Quercus. Okay, is there any specificity, though, in terms of which? Not, not at this point. Not at this right. point. Okay, but, but as a matter of um, policy, the, the city has generally replaced oaks with protected species yeah we typically go like for like right okay very good thank you commissioners any other questions of staff commissioner lanson uh, thank you Ms. kendall just a kind of quick question um this property right now is not being used for anything correct that's correct and and just so i could confirmation who owns the property the property is currently owned by arc investments i believe uh, it was previously owned by the school district Okay, so the ARC actually does own it. Um, by virtue of what they're doing is, um, in terms of if they, this is, if they do this project, is there any additional revenue that the city gets in terms of taxes or other revenue? No, there'll be no additional tax revenue. Okay. Um, and, but they'd be ultimately improving the land, uh, which right now is, is unimproved and, and nobody's watching it, it sounds like. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Nothing further. Okay. Any other questions of? All right. Very good. We will move now to the appellant representative to speak, and we've got um, multiple representatives from the appellant. And I apologize in advance if I'm butchering your name, but I believe the lead is uh, Andy Lisi. Lesie Lisi. Um, and there are multiple other members of the appellant team. You can divide between yourselves how you like, but you have up to 15 minutes uh, to give your presentation. So Ms. Lisey, good evening. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you. 
I hope you can hear me okay. I had technical difficulties in the past. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. We can hear and see you just fine. Okay, um, if great. you could begin by giving your name and city of residence for the record. Okay, my name is Andrea or Andy Lisi. I'm outside counsel to waste management with Ramey Moose Manley. I currently reside in Orange County, California. So as the appellant, we're asking the planning commission to deny or delay a decision on this project until either an EIR or a mitigated meg deck is prepared and circulated for public review and comment, precisely as staff originally contemplated in July of 2020 when preparing an agreement with in Viacom to prepare a mitigated negative declaration for the very DP permit before you this evening. That's in attachment 10 of your staff report at page 141. A mitigated neg deck or an EIR would also be beneficial to the city because it would include a mitigation monitoring and reporting program allowing the conditions of approval to be enforced by the public as well as the city, particularly since there is no conditional use permit or special use permit able to be revoked if conditions are violated uh, with this proposed project. I wanna offer a little bit of background to the commission um, for this project from my perspective, since you all were spared from having to make a recommendation to the council on the franchise agreement uh, before the March 2021 approval and after the conclusion of the city's confidential RFP process, I'll then touch briefly on why the class 32 exemption under CEQA should not be relied on. So thus queuing up, I guess, the tough judgment calls that the chairman referenced earlier that you all have to make. Um, I just wanna note that I've practiced CEQA and land use law for over 22 years now, mostly for applicants and public agencies. And never have I witnessed an applicant go to such great lengths to limit the information provided to the public and presumably the public agency from which it seeks a project approval. This was done here first as part of Athens response to the city's RFP for the franchise agreement. And now it's part of the proposed project before you tonight, the scope of which still remains a bit unclear to me. So why, you know, one must ask is Athens repeatedly represented to the city council on March 9th, 2021 at the hearing on the franchise agreement, why it had the ability to immediately expand a site in Santa Paula to use for the same purposes before you tonight. And I submit it was because the RFP made it clear that the uh, responding companies to the RFP had to show the ability to service the franchise agreement terms without having first to entitle and build a new local infrastructure for things like parking, collection trucks, refueling those collection trucks with CNG and maintaining those trucks. This was a key issue at the city council hearing, if you read the transcript. So later I discovered that the Santa Paula site on Corporation Street did not have the entitlements in place, which would allow Athens to park its collection trucks as promised to the council. That's at attachment 10, page 169. What the public and waste management presumably and the city council members presumably did not know was that by late 2020, Athens had already you know, made an offer to purchase the Conejo property that's before you this evening and had completed its due diligence on the site months before the March 9th hearing. It did so using the prospective law group, which is different from the firm representing Athens um, probably here tonight <coughs> on behalf of ARC, or ARC investment, not Athens directly, and referred to the site only by the situs address in all public documents. Uh, when asked by the school district the purpose of the sale, prospective law group replied in February of 2021 that it would likely be used by Athens pursuant <coughs> to the long-term waste hauling franchise contract with the city of Thousand Oaks. That's at attachment 10, pages 103 through 107. So the fact that they waited to apply in July of 2021 uh, formally uh, is not necessarily disparative of our client's concerns that Athens has been piecemealing this project under CEQA. So 
again, I think it was because Athens didn't want to lose out on the franchise agreement. If it admitted it had to go through a more lengthy, potentially environmental process and, and site for the site to be developed. So here we are tonight with some speakers undoubtedly poised to dismiss the merits of this appeal by disparaging waste management's motives rather than recognizing that waste management seeks to hold Athens accountable for following the law. The current circumstances were created by Athens' failure to properly plan, and our client simply just called foul. So yes, the trucks are currently being stored and transferred back and forth to Sun Valley. Uh, yes, you know, given these circumstances, if you were to approve the project here tonight, it would be a benefit for those VMT miles traveled because it was never properly looked at in the first place. Uh, Tonight, staff has made it finally clear that the CNG facility proposed as part of the project would be private. However, there's no condition of approval in your proposed resolution that I could find that would require this, even if it were you know, to be enforceable. And this would affect potentially the VMT miles uh, traveled because if it's open to the public, as Athens had proposed, in Santa Paula when it was stating that they were going to use the Santa Paula site, it was proposed to be open to the public. So now for the first time, it's finally been clarified that it would be private. There should be a condition of approval as such. It's also never been answered. What are the plans for the remaining three acres of this site? Um, so far I've heard maybe that no plans are proposed, nothing's foreseeable. But if you were to take a look at the response to the RFP for the franchise agreement when Athens was proposing this very same use uh, in Santa Paula, there was a very detailed transfer station MRF that was also proposed as part of the um, headquarters, which it appears Athens proposing with the conference rooms and all the administrative uh, uses, as well as to park the collection trucks, maintain them and refuel them. So I would ask, you know, what are the plans for the remaining three acres of this site? With respect to the CEQA merits and why the class 32 exemption does not apply. So under CEQA guideline section 15332 as staff laid out subdivision B on its face, a project site must be substantially surrounded by urban uses. Here, there's development on arguably, I guess, two and a half sides of, of the site that there is existing urban uses. However, much of the site to the west and to the southwest is open space. It's also containing coastal sage scrub habitat. It's not been necessarily developed as, as, as if this infill exemption was in an urban city setting which it typically is used and, and relied on for such. So just by the plain meaning in terms of, of these requirements, the project site does not fit this criteria. Second, under 15332 subdivision C, the project site must have absolutely no value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species. For all the reasons explained in our expert comment letters uh, submitted by Scott Cashin, the site has potential for habitat. While it's been graded and unfortunately was graded you know, right before the November BRA was prepared by Athens. Um, so there's presumably no vegetation on the site now. There had been vegetation previously so it shows there's potential for habitat, either in the seed banks of the endangered, rare and threatened species, plant species that are known to occur in the area, and or as habitat for the coastal lizard, as the BRA references, there's potential, although maybe not unlikely, it's still potential. Um, with respect to the exceptions for reliance on a categorical exemption, I'd point out that the ability to rely on this category exemption does not appear here because there are unusual circumstances that 
show, the project could have a significant impact. This is, goes to the cumulative you know, potential biological resource issues as well as the site being located at the urban wildland interface area in a very high fire hazard severity zone. So part of our appeal and comment letter was, you know, there's no evidence in the record showing that there's been consideration of potential interference with evacuation times, evacuation responses, should there be a wildfire and presumably Athens will not allow its collection truck fleet to burn up in the fire, they'd wanna be evacuating those trucks too. So using the same roadways as residents and, and business owners. Uh, with that, I just want to note that I'm here for any questions. I'm not gonna go point by point through um, staff's presentation. Um, you know, there's a lot of material before you. I recognize that um, if you have any questions for me or um, I think Doug Corcoran's in the audience, if, if you have any for him, we're certainly here and happy to answer your, your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lisey. Commissioners, are there any questions of the appellant? Commissioner Link? Commissioner McMahon? Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm feeling a little uh, naive or bewildered. I'm trying to understand how does waste management benefit by this project not going forward? Um, why, why do you care? Why do they care? It's not going to change the contract that's in force right now. That's a good question. And, um, you know, I know that Athens has argued that the trial court has denied our petition. Um, that is currently up on appeal, so it is subject to appeal. It, there's a remedy issue and it's not an easy one should we prevail on the merits. So waste management at the 50,000 foot level cares because it's important that industry all comply with the same laws. So we all comply with the California Environmental Quality Act, state planning and zoning law, doing environmental review as it should be done. And here the point is Athens has cut corners has relied on exemptions where exemptions should not be relied on in our view. And if we are to prevail on the merits, um, you know, there will be a remedy and the remedy could be rescission of the franchise agreement while allowing for, you know, a graceful time for um, transitions should the city decide to go with another company or continue to go with Athens. So this project before you is just part of a larger, much larger context that I wanted to impress upon all of you um, that you might not otherwise be aware of. And so would our client benefit from requiring environmental review? Yes, our client would, and as would the public with an opportunity to review, comment on the technical studies that are before you for which we think they are deficient. And I've outlined all that in the comment letter um, it would benefit the public as well as waste management. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Link. Uh, Ms. Lisey, this is for my own edification, I suppose, but uh, it, it sounds like uh, waste management is making an allegation of piecemealing under CEQA, which would be a fairly substantial accusation, but I, I just want to kind of get the facts straight as to how the, the piecemealing conclusion was arrived at. So uh, I believe you had said that Athens had contemplated using a site in Santa Paula for parking their collection vehicles as part of the original RFP. Is that correct? That's correct. So as part of that, because the city would be the lead agency on the environmental document, that that site could not be analyzed as part of the original CEQA document or environmental document for the RFP, correct? No. So at the time when the Santa Paula site was first disclosed at the RFP process, we were also making the point that that site had to be included in the franchise agreement award because you're looking at the totality of, of the project and under CEQA, that um, test is whether or not 
approval of a project would result in a reasonably foreseeable consequence or other project. So here it's not dictated by jurisdictional boundaries, you know, just because a consequence would be in Santa Paula, another jurisdiction doesn't mean that it's not part of the same project. Same with ownership. A, an applicant need not necessarily own a particular site to make it reasonably foreseeable. It's all in looking at the totality of the circumstances and whether or not there's that causation factor. So here it's it's a muddy, you know, situation because Athens was saying they were gonna go forward in Santa Paula. Now come to find out it was really always all about this site. Good. I mean, I didn't mean to sound too accusatory, but was there, is it reasonable to assume that Athens had already contemplated this site when they were submitting for the RFP? Yes, and I believe the emails and the attachments that we included in the appeal support that. Okay. So regardless of the actual acquisition of the property in Thousand Oaks and use of the Santa Paula site, the uh, Athens is still fulfilling their obligations to the city using the existing site in the valley, correct? I don't feel necessarily comfortable in knowing all because I'm not quite sure all the details. I do, you know, have knowledge and evidence that we put forth as part of the appeal that we believe Athens is storing waste in their trucks because they're unable to make it to the landfills in time to dump their loads and that they're doing this in Sun Valley because that's where the collection trucks are currently being parked and because they're showing up at the Simi Valley landfill as early as six o'clock, 6.15 in the morning for which it's impossible that they could have gone and collected that waste and material in Thousand Oaks before making it to the landfill. So I'm not sure that Athens, if you were to scrutinize the terms of the franchise agreement now is currently in compliance. But, you know, I'm not uh, an expert in the day to day. You know, that's the evidence I have before me uh, to support my suspicions. I mean, it wouldn't, wouldn't it be equally possible that the collection trucks in, because as a result of the franchise agreement with the city of Thousand Oaks, uh, that Athens is using the Simi Valley landfill for refuse collected in other locations? I mean, wouldn't that be equally valid? Well, as part of the materials before you in attachment 10, we have a declaration that was submitted as part of the litigation that Athens only has city of Santa Paula contracts um, for which it would be collecting material other than the city of Thousand Oaks, which is very small in comparison, uh, and for which they would not need a new collection, you know, hauling yard to park their trucks and maintain their trucks. Okay. Understood. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, Ms. Lisi, I just have a, a few questions, kind of following up on the, some of the non sequa questions. Um, you commented as to the habitat issue, and um, obviously we're very protective about our environment and our open space and, and, and animals and stuff like that, but from your comments, it doesn't sound like you've ever specifically identified any um, animals that actually were specific use in this area, whether they were protected or not. Did you have any statistical information or evidence or anything as to this area being part of any kind of habitat for animals? Uh, so the letters from Scott Cashin, which are independent biological resource consultant, he submitted two letters that are part of the packet. Um, he pointed out that after doing the CNDBB database, the California Natural Diversity Database searches, that the site has potential habitat for the Conejo dudlia, the buckwheat, which are protected plant species, and the lion's pinchata. Um, also noted that there is potential for foraging for the coastal uh, lizard, I think it is. Um, the coast horned lizard rather, and you know, pointed out that the BRA itself says that it's maybe unlikely because of disturbance of the site that the lizard is there, but you know, unlikely doesn't mean that there's definitively no value. 
Ms. Lisi, I'm, I'm also an attorney, so I'm going to basically sustain an, a hearsay objection based on that to the extent that that person's looking at other information that they didn't actually do. That I don't think is information we can necessarily use to base our information, our judgment, if in fact they don't have personal knowledge of it. Would that be well, true? Well, and I, I understand and appreciate that. Um, you know, I guess the point is that this is a private site for which there's no trespassing sites finds, you know, all around our client, our client could not just hire a botanist to go trunching around up on their site. So there's no ability to prove with absolute definity uh, that there is habitat value. I guess the point is, is that under CEQA, before relying on a categorical exemption, an agency must show that there is absolutely no value for habitat, which means even if there's a potential for habitat that there should be environmental analysis and this goes all back to the legislature's intent in CEQA to err on the side of you know conducting environmental review rather than exempting and not giving the public an opportunity to comment I on appreciate that, that but this is your appeal so to the extent you haven't done that information how is it you expect us to actually speculate as to whether or not that issue would be satisfied um, I'm just, again, this is your appeal. Uh, I'm trying to see if you have any further evidence to support that issue. Uh, if it was feasible to go out to the site and Athens were to agree to allow our client to go out there and botanists, we would be happy to do so. You, are if you saying you not, never asked for access to the site to conduct any evaluation to support your position? Um, well, considering the history of the litigation, I, I have not personally asked, no. I doubt that it would be granted, but I would like to hear if Athens would be willing to do so this evening. I, again, that's, again, this is an appeal that we're hearing to Nova. We'd like to have had that information, in fact, if you wanted to get it. So it's, it's tough that we don't have that because that, if it, that's one of your arguments that it's supposed to be that kind of protected area, again, we would hope you would have looked at that information to, pre to present it to us as opposed to just assuming they would not allow and be cooperative. But let, let me get to my second question. Um, you indicate uh, one of the bases of the appeal is the vehicle miles traveled. Um, did you ever do a comparison as to the vehicle miles traveled by waste management during its time to see whether or not um, the change in Athens routes necessarily lowered the vehicle miles to the extent where waste management was actually using more of those miles before when they had the contract? So there's a letter from Neil Lidicote in, in our attachments. I don't know if you've had a chance to review it. Um, we did not do a, a entirety of VMT analysis because it wasn't our burden to do so. That's the burden of a public agency when it approves a project under CEQA. So at the time of the franchise agreement award, no, we did not do that. Well, again, you're cr as you indicate, you're crying it foul. Been, it wouldn't have been necessary at that time either. I'm just saying to the extent you're crying foul with regard to this issue, I'm, I'm curious to see whether or not ultimately the vehicle miles travel that waste management was doing ultimately was more than what Athens is doing under its current situation because then I guess the question being is, isn't waste management being a bit hypocritical in terms of complaining about something they were already exceeding? Have you seen my point? Well, you take the baseline under CEQA as you find it. So the existing environment under the prior franchise agreement with waste management was as is. So had the city elected to continue with waste management, there would have been no analysis to do. The city, in deciding to go with Athens, should have done that VMT analysis and truly vetted whether or not the Santa Paula site was viable. And so, it was not. So Athens should be subject to a different standard than waste management was for the exact same issue? Yeah, because under CEQA, when you're making a discretionary approval of a new project, you're looking at what the changes, that incremental delta in the environment from as it was existing to what it would be, you know, as approved. So it was not our client's obligation to do that analysis. I Commissioner Lanson, if I might make an unqualified, qualified uh, um, offering I, in this I regard. I yield my time. Uh, Commissioner Lang. It's my understanding from the guidance from OPR, the Office of Planning and Research, in regard to VMT is that projects that are categorically exempt under CEQA are not subject to a VMT analysis. So if we do find that there is a categorical exemption as the administrative hearing did, then the project would actually be exempt from VMT or VMT analysis. Ms. Lisi, would you agree with that? 
Well, actually, I would only note, too, that the city has proposed to rely on its own threshold, which is not supported by substantial evidence. And that is that a VMT analysis is not required because the project does not exceed or cause 100 or more PM peak trips, uh, VMP, VMT trips. So as part of our appeal and comment letter, that was, you know, what was noted as well that, you know, that threshold is more related to the old levels of service standards and not necessarily what VMT is, is required. I, I get your point. If I you, guess the question being is if it was category exempt, would you find that issue is not a problem? I think it goes to whether or not an exception applies to the categorical exemption under 153002. And if an exception does apply, then that issue is no longer a problem, right? Uh, if the exception applies, then the reliance on the categorical exemption is in a, inappropriate. It's unlawful. Yeah, you're just not going to so answer this, my question, are you? <laughs> well, right, no, I, because I, I, it's, it's poised in a premise that I don't agree with, so. I, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Commissioner Buss? I'm good. Thank you. All right, I have no questions. Um, Chair, Chair Newman, I had one more follow-up question. My apologies. Commissioner Link. Uh, Ms. Lisey, I just had a, a question with regard to the infill uh, contention that you're making. Is it your interpretation of CEQA that a project is would not or could not qualify as infill unless it was surrounded on all sides? In So, it, yes, the city's general plan makes note that the, pro the parcel that is immediately to the south and west mostly west of this project is open space and therefore non-buildable. So are you saying that precludes this project from being considered infill despite being surrounded on all sides by improvements? Uh, well, it's, I, I believe it doesn't meet the criteria because it's not substantially surrounded by urban uses. Yes. So there's limited case law in this area, but what case law there is, has upheld reliance on the infill exemption. If you have, you know, open space in the context of a developed park, like a regional park or you know, something of that nature. Here, it's a different circumstance and why it does not apply is because it is open space. There is coastal sites scrub habitat. So it's not the type of urban uses that this infill exemption is referring to. I mean, even if it is infill for all intents and purposes, it is disturbed land because it does provide access to two water towers, which I'm not sure are either owned by or maintained by the city of Thousand Oaks, or, or perhaps um, it would be Cal American in this area. I, I couldn't tell you for sure, but I mean, I, I, I understand that it is designated open space, but it is disturbed. Is that something you would agree with? Uh, it's not disturbed in the sense of being urban uses, so no. I, I recognize that it, it's been maybe parts have been disturbed for access, but it's not, again, the sort of urban uses that the CEQA guidelines is referring to. Okay, understood. Thank you. Commissioners, are there other questions of the appellant team? Um, okay. Excuse me, TOTV asks that if anyone's cell phone is close to their microphone, if they could move it back a little bit. It's causing a issue. Aha, that is the source of the static. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we ask now for the applicant and applicant's representative to speak. Um, you as well will have uh, 15 minutes. There's uh, an applicant team here as well, I believe, led by Jennifer Lynch. Um, I'll turn on your microphone. Um, good evening, Ms. Lynch. Uh, we ask that you begin by introducing yourself and your city of residence. And you have uh, up to 15 minutes for yourself or your team to speak. Good evening. Good evening. I uh, just want to make sure that I can pull my slides up. Do I press the play or? Perfect. 
Okay, good evening, Chairman Newman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Jennifer Lynch. I am a partner with Manat, Phelps & Phillips, and I'm here representing the applicant, ARC Investments, as well as the future operator of this project, which is Athens Services. We're grateful for the opportunity to respond to Waste Management's appeal and also answer any questions that the commissioners may have tonight. Before I begin, I wanna thank staff for their detailed and thorough review of our application. As I mentioned at the administrative hearing, this is a very small and very simple project that has been made much less simple for reasons that have nothing to do with what we are actually proposing. We very much appreciate how professional, objective, and detailed your staff has been throughout this process. We have several members of the applicant team here with us tonight to answer any questions that the commissioners may have. We have a representative of ARC Investments, the applicant. We have several team members from Athens Services. We have our project site designers here and our project engineer, as well as uh, two representatives from Clean Energy, which is the company that will be uh, designing, permitting, and installing the CNG system on the site. The staff reports detail um, the proposed project scope, but I do wanna highlight a few basic aspects, especially given waste management's uh, statement a few minutes ago that they're still confused about the scope of this very simple project. This project site is small, it is less than four and a half acres, and its primary purpose is to store overnight empty Athens services trucks. There will be no waste, recyclables, or organics brought to this site, there is no proposed material sorting facility. Uh, there's no trucks that are gonna be parked on site that contain waste. Overnight storage of waste has never been a part of this proposal. Nonetheless, staff has drafted and previously approved a condition of approval 60, which expressly prohibits waste from being parked overnight on the site. And neither ARC Investments nor Athens Services has opposed this condition. We welcome it. And we have no intention and have never had any intention of storing waste overnight on this site. Waste management has provided you with an unvetted and unattested spreadsheet um, that alleges that because Athens has disposed of loads at waste management's landfill early in the morning, this somehow indicates that at this site in the future, we will be storing waste overnight. Um, for sake of argument, uh, even if the days and times on the spreadsheet are correct, uh, Athens believes what they're probably indicating are uh, loads that are disposed of, like they're roll-off containers. So these are sort of individual containers that are stored overnight at a client's uh, site, a commercial site, and that are picked up separate from a regular commercial route. So that's probably what these early morning dumps are. Um, again, we're not storing. Uh, filled waste trucks on this site um, by virtue of both our proposal and the city's condition. Per, uh, supporting the primary use of truck storage is one extremely small office building. Um, it's shown on this diagram as the dark blue rectangle at the bottom of a larger, lighter blue rectangle. That's how small this office building is. Um, for Scale and context, you can compare it to those white existing industrial buildings and see just how small this proposed office building is. There was a question about uh, whether customers will be coming to this site. They will not. Uh, customer issues are dealt with at the existing Athens Sustainability Center in the city of Thousand Oaks. Now the lighter blue rectangle above the darker one is the proposed maintenance building. This is also small. Again, you can compare it to those existing industrial buildings that are across the street and immediately adjacent to our site. While we're comparing, we can also compare the size of the site's primary use, the truck storage and parking area, and compare it to our neighbor's parking lots. And we can see that even the paved area proposed here is much smaller than just the automobile parking areas uh, serving our neighbor across the street. Our project also proposes a significant number of new trees. We realize that this is the city of Thousand Oaks. We wanna stay on brand. As Ms. Kendall uh, mentioned, we are proposing 91 new trees, 34 of which will be Coast Live Oak. The project does require removal of one existing oak tree at the entrance, but as a consequence of this project approval, that lost tree will be replaced by 34 new Coast Live Oak trees. These proposed tree plantings significantly exceed the city's requirements, 
Only 58 new trees total are required on this site and we're providing 91. Applying the city's oak tree replacement ratio of three to one, only three coast live oak would be required here and we are providing 34. A few points on the existing condition of the project site shown here. Again, the project site is small. You can see on this aerial that there are single buildings in the immediate vicinity that are bigger than the entirety of our project site. The project is proposed on this site because this is an ideal location for a storage yard. It's vacant, previously graded development pad, surrounded by much larger industrial buildings and complexes. Waste management alleges uh, for the first time that this project site is not substantially surrounded by urban uses, but this just isn't true. We're located in the middle of an existing industrial park. There are industrial buildings on all three sides. The only reason there aren't industrial uses immediately to the south of the project boundary is because Athens has decided to only uh, develop a portion of these parcels as opposed to the entire parcels. There are high voltage power lines that run along the south and the west, or sorry, the south and the east of the project site as well. And uh, it, there's nothing in CEQA that defines what substantially surrounded by means. There's nothing in the case law, there's nothing in the guidelines, um, but certainly substantially surrounded would apply here just looking at this aerial. The uses proposed are consistent with the general plan, specific plan, and zoning code. The staff report and your proposed uh, planning commission resolution rely on the permitted use of contractor storage yard. But we also wanna point out that there are several other use categories permitted in the M1 zone that could apply here, including uh, drayage, which I had to look up, it's another word for hauling, um, and trucking terminals, terminals implying both parking and dispatching activities. Storage yards for transportation equipment are also expressly permitted in this zone, as well as incidental uses and structures supporting the primary use of truck storage. Waste management's appeal continues to allege that this site has potential for habitat of value for listed endangered or threatened species. However, this is the infill development exemption and that is not the test. The test is whether this site has value, has a habitat of value on the site for specific listed endangered or threatened species, and this site does not. Waste management argument seems to be based on two grounds. First, that there is vacant open space nearby, and second, that there is purportedly unique volcanic soils present on the site. But neither of these allegations outweigh the findings of an actual site survey by a qualified biologist who surveyed this specific site on foot, took photos of the existing dirt pad, and determined in um, its related biological resources technical report that there is no habitat of value for specific listed species on this site. This project does not result in vehicle miles traveled impacts. And if I heard Ms. Lisi correctly, uh, it seems like she now agrees. She also seems to agree that the baseline is what we measure against, and here, Athens Services trucks have been serving the city for months already. It's hard to put trip numbers into context, but the city's adopted screening threshold provides our guidepost. The city has a long established screening threshold that is applied to projects across the board and it's 100 p.m. peak hour trips. This project generates 48 p.m. peak hour trips, so that's less than half. Now waste management's appeal attacks the city's threshold, says that the city's threshold isn't good enough despite the fact it's based on your staff's professional expertise, local knowledge about the city of Thousand Oaks, and your city council's approval. However, even without the city's threshold, it's clear that this project has no VMT impact. And this is because, as I mentioned, these trucks are already in the city. These truck trips are already taking place on city streets. And they have been for years, regardless of what color the trucks are painted. Athens Services is currently running the same number of trucks as the city's prior haulers, although slightly fewer, as now services are consolidated into one company. So we have equal or fewer trucks than we always have, and allowing those trucks to park overnight here in the city that they serve reduces, not increases, vehicle miles traveled. 
It's worth noting that Waste Management has sued the City of Thousand Oaks for awarding its franchise agreement to Athens, and one of the allegations in that lawsuit is that Athens trucks will be increasing GHG emissions by traveling to and from Sun Valley and Santa Paula on a daily basis to park their trucks overnight. Now, Athens wants to park its trucks here, and of course, Waste Management is doing all it can to obstruct this project. Waste management continues to allege this project is evading environmental review, but this is just not true. Extensive environmental review has occurred um, by technical specialists, the city planning department, the city public works department, the city's third party CEQA consultant, the police department, and the fire department. And the findings of these experts determine that the criteria of the infill exemption apply. The staff reports go into extensive detail about each individual criteria for that infill development exemption. Um, and each of them, there's ample substantial evidence for every single one of those criteria. I did wanna note that um, in the late letter today that waste management uh, submitted, um, they now claim for the first time that the city's, or that the project's construction NOx emissions will exceed uh, the county's thresholds, but this is incorrect. The threshold that waste management um, references in their letter from today does not apply to construction emissions, and that's very clear from the county's guidelines. And finally, to, to end on a, a high note, I wanted to take you along Caneo Center Drive with us to show how compatible this project is with its surrounding uses and how ideal this site is for this specific use. So, one of the reasons that this site is so great for this project is that it's not visible from Caneo Center Drive, given that the pad is on average more than 30 feet above the street and more than 53 feet back from the curb. So these are visual simulations showing how obscured the site is. This is the view of somebody driving west along Caneo Center Drive. That um, chain link fence that's against the, the right of way is not on our project, that's the adjacent property. Our project will be up on that slope to the left behind those trees. And here we're driving down Caneo Center Drive. You can see a little bit of the wrought iron fence that's proposed, but not very much of it. And here we have turned around and now we're heading back east. Um, you can see the proposed retaining wall and that's the project entrance. And again, it's very hard to see this project. It's buffered by this amazing existing landscape slope. It's set back from the roadway, and it's very compatible with the surrounding uses. As a note, this is the um, existing property to the west of our site. You'll see that it is not set back like our site is. There is no screening, and it has a much more um, industrial aesthetic than our project site would have. Same, this is on the right. You can see the existing industrial building that's located immediately east to the proposed project site. Um, and again, there's barely any setback at all. There's absolutely no screening. And we're very proud of how well our project fits in with its surroundings. Uh, thank you very much. We, again, we have many members of the applicant team here to answer any specific or generalized questions that the commissioners may have. Thank you, Ms. Lynch, for your presentation. Please remain at the podium for a moment. Commissioners, do we have questions of Commissioner Lanson? Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Um, if there is a Patrick Cowles here, I apologize. I'm going to use your questions. Um, sorry about that. I'm going to use your questions because they were great. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Ms. Lynch, for going through the issues. But again, there was a, a it came in the supplement, um, and it kind of addresses a number of the issues. You kind of went over and some that you didn't, but I want to kind of go through those because I think it's kind of the primary issues that I was concerned about. Absolutely. Uh, initially, um, the, the letter uh, points uh, in terms of what you pointed out first in terms of the trucks being uh, basically stored with, with waste in them. Um, do you have any actual knowledge that what you indicated was actually what's happening? What, that what I indicated? Right. You said that it was probably by virtue of picking up client, I guess, containers that had waste in it. Yes. No. That was our analysis from our uh, Athens Services operators. I was just 
I haven't, I don't know where the information on that spreadsheet specifically came from. I can't attest to its accuracy as it was provided by waste management, but assuming that those are the correct load times and amounts and days, that's what they would be. They would be primarily roll off containers. Is there any company policy you have that you don't store waste in trash can in the trucks overnight? Is that a typical process? That is not typical. It is not typical to store waste in trucks on a parking site overnight. So Athens does not do that. There's no plans to do that on this site. This is, I understand why perhaps somebody would be concerned who doesn't understand how these sorts of parking facilities operate, but that's, that's never been part of this proposal. And I think as you indicated, there was one of the requirements or conditions that that isn't going to happen, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there's a condition and we would be violating it if we did store waste overnight on the site. Um, the next question, and again, I apologize for using your questions, but they're great. The next question was item two of the conditions uh, kind of doesn't specifically indicate Athens is the only one that's going to use this facility. Is Athens the only company that's going to be using this facility? Yes, that is what our proposal is. There is no proposal for a public use for other people coming in. This is, uh, there's a CNG fueling station and that is going to be used to service Athens trucks. Uh, third question was in terms of when the trucks leave in the morning, how many leave at a time? And is there any interval process? So the trucks are staggered when they leave. There are trucks that go to collect those roll-off bins that I mentioned. There are trucks that are designated for commercial routes, and then there's trucks that are designated for residential routes. They do not all leave at the same time, and they certainly do not come back at the same time. Is there some interval formula? Again, you don't have to go through it. I'm just saying, is there some formula where that, that is kind of structured? No, there is no specific formula. And to date, we have not established exactly how many trucks are leaving at exactly a specific time each morning. Because uh, the next question was ultimately is, uh, and again, he, did, he reviewed the documents. Apparently, there's uh, Mr. Baker indicated three trucks would be leaving at a time uh, to keep it under the 60 decibel requirement. Sure. So. I believe the commenter is confusing mobile noise sources with stationary noise sources. So the noise technical study looks at these separately, which is industry standard. So the input assumption of three slow moving trucks on the site at a time, that's to capture the noise of s trucks that are idling on the site, trucks that are been moved into the maintenance facility, um, trucks that are fueling or moving to the fueling station, that isn't the mobile truck noise from trucks going on to Conejo Center Drive. So that piece of the noise study is separate. And what that piece found um, was that it would take a doubling of traffic on Conejo Center Drive to generate a perceptible mobile noise increase. So the project doesn't come anywhere close to that. If every single truck left at the same time, it would only be increasing traffic on Caneo Center Drive by about 13%. And so, you know, noise isn't directly additive and it would take a doubling. So increasing traffic, the number of traffic vehicles and trips on Caneo Center Drive by 100% to result in even a perceptible noise difference. So, so those are the two different issues. They're, they're separate. There's mobile noise, so the trucks moving out of the site and onto their routes, and then there's stationary noise that is occurring on the site at any given moment. And, and again, I'm not familiar with the, the, how the process works. Is there a dispatcher that kind of tells trucks when to go and how to go? How does the actual process work? Sure, so that is one of the uses that is in that office building. So that's where we have our truck dispatch uh, operators. And so they're the ones that are dispatching trucks throughout the day. And, and are they looking at, uh, again, a, a time log, or how do they discern, decide exactly which trucks leave when? So I would have to punt that one to one of our Athens services um, operators, if I could bring one of them up. Sure. He wanted to come up and talk anyway. I can see it. <laughs> I was waiting for the moment. Sir, please state your name and city of residence for the of record. Of course. My name is Cesar Torres, and I live in Valencia, California. So do you have an answer? I do have an answer. So we stagger our employees to come in at different shifts, right? So depending on the shift that they come in and arrive, that's the time that the trucks would be leaving at that point. Is there any more distinction between the, the, the distribution of the truck? I mean, is it just basically they decide when they want to leave or is there a dispatch? No, it's, it's based on routing. So, so we, we establish the routes, right? We do pre-route and each one of them has a route sheet that they had to abide by. 
right? And that route sheet designates what time they're going to leave the yard and what time they're going to come back. And those are done, is it done every three trucks per five minutes or something? It, it, it's, it's staggered. It just depends on the service area that they're going to be doing and the services that they're going to be rendering. So residential accounts, as an example, in Thousand Oaks, there is an ordinance that we're not supposed to start before 7 o'clock. And so those trucks are obviously going to be staggered so that they start after 7 o'clock. Okay, just doesn't sound like it's done according to by the minute, so to speak. On the route sheets, it is. Once we establish okay. the, the facility and we're able to establish the routing, then they will be. There will okay. be a structured approach. In there is something that do. does, okay, that's, that was really my, my focus. So I have no further questions. Thank you. Very good. Commissioner Buzz. I'd like to follow up with you, sir, if you can just stay for one more Mr. second. Mr. Yeah, Torres. <clears throat> so I, just for my own edification, my understanding of dispatch, because I worked in automotive service for a couple decades, is that the dispatch would actually be for the maintenance yard. Those dispatchers aren't dispatchers for the, for the routing. The routing would be pre-established for these trucks, correct? That is correct. Okay, so when we're talking about dispatch, we're not talking about dispatchers sending out calls. We're talking about dispatchers for the, for the maintenance yard. Correct. Okay, uh, that, that's all I needed from you. Thank you. Got a couple other questions. So uh, you said that uh, you have had a biologist out there. Yes. And that was in 2021, if I understood correctly, from staff. Is that correct? Yes. So our biologist went out in November 2021, did a on-site reconnaissance survey, um, drafted a biological technical study that was based on the findings of that survey. We submitted that to city staff as part of our application. City staff had that report uh, reviewed by the city's own third-party independent CEQA consultant, um, and that is what... Uh, the staff report is based on, and that is what the determination that the Class 32 CEQA exemption applies is also based on. Perfect. And my understanding is, is that the, the property itself, uh, we keep referring to it as disturbed, I would say pre-graded or whatever. Yes. And that happened prior to your acquisition of the property, correct? Yes. And are you aware of what it was going to be prior to what the intended uh, purpose was for the previous owner? Yes, absolutely. So that was the Conejo Valley Unified School District, and they proposed a project almost identical to ours. So they were proposing, and I believe there were permits approved for a bus maintenance, storage, uh, dispatch, and warehouse facility. So that would have been their maintenance yard? Yes. Copy that. All right. <clears throat> and then just to follow up on this overnight storage of garbage, because this seems to be a hot topic, um, so is it not common practice to store uh, trash in vehicles overnight, or is it illegal in some way, shape, or form? I believe it's not common practice. It would be illegal if a, a permit, like the one that the city is contemplating issuing, would have a condition that prohibited it. Do you have a permit to store trash overnight in your Sun Valley or Santa Paula facilities? No, no, we do not. So if you don't have a permit, if you did have that practice and you had been putting trash in the morning at a facility at one of your competitors' monitors, would you say that it would be reasonable to assume that they would call you out on that and attempt to penalize you for that through whatever agency enforces that? But it's not part of this proposal, and Correct. it's not what we're asking. It would be similar to a Starbucks down the street from my house having a drive through Doesn't mean that a Starbucks down the street from your house is going to have a drive through if neither Starbucks nor the city wants a drive through That's there. not my question. My question would be, uh, because your, your Sun Valley and Santa Paula facilities don't permit that, I would assume that if they were aware that you were dumping trash, they would attempt to prove that it was one of those two existing sites, correct? I see what you're saying. Yes, of course. Okay. So it, it would be reasonable to assume it's probably not the case? Yes. Okay. All right. I think that's, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Buss. Commissioner Link? I just had one quick question. So uh, when did you begin uh, preparing the proposal for in response to the city's RFP? Do you remember what year, month, vaguely? Preparing... Sorry, preparing the RFP. Preparing the proposal to, in response to the city's RFP for a... For the franchise agreement. For the franchise agreement, correct. It, it, would have, sorry. it would have been when the RFP was released. I don't have that date here. <laughs> Does staff have that answer? We, we'll come back to staff in a moment. In a okay. moment. Uh, the, the only other question I had was just in regard to when you contemplated purchasing the actual site. So I'm trying to tie those two things together. Sure. 
Sure. So at the time that the franchise agreement was awarded, so certainly would, this would also apply well before then when the RFP process was ongoing, Athens Services did not have control of this site. There was no escrow account opened to obtain this site. I don't believe there was even an offer price. So as listed out in the RFP materials prepared by Athens, there were several different alternatives identified for where trucks could be stored. It could be the Santa Paula site, it could be some other site, it could be a new site that wasn't purchased yet, it could be this site, it could be some other site. Um, they just didn't know. And CEQA, of course, doesn't require you to have a crystal ball and identify every possible future action that may or may not occur as a result of awarding the franchise agreement. Thank you. All right, Ms. Lynch, thank you very much for your, your testimony and your responses. Next, we go to public comments. We have nine public speakers this evening, so each will be allotted four minutes, and we will ask each to state their name and city of residence. Um, because there was some confusion before about um, who's a public, a public speaker and who's with the applicant or appellant, I'm also gonna ask all public speakers if you have some connection, financial or otherwise, to either the appellant or the applicant, if you would also disclose that as well. Um, I think that's of interest to the commission and to the public at large. So. Our first three public speakers will be Doug Spondello, followed by Juan Rodriguez, and then Jennifer McCormick. Uh, Mr. Spondello, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? I can, you have four minutes. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. For the record, my name is Doug Spondello, and I'm a lifelong resident of Thousand Oaks. I'm also not at all affiliated with either, either parties in this matter. My comments here will be in support of Athens Services truck storage. Thousand Oaks is a geographically diverse community with easily identifiable land use priorities throughout the city. The Caneo Center Drive property that Athens is seeking to use for truck dispatch really is an ideal location for such a facility. Not only is the location ideal, but the need is clear and should be understood by all residents of our city. Traffic and emissions are at a constant and ever present issue, especially in Southern California. There are a few days that go by where we don't hear some sort of discussion about mitigating one or both. The proposed Athens truck dispatch yard is an opportunity to limit, limit both vehicle miles traveled and carbon emissions. It would be very short-sighted and counterintuitive to contract with a new waste hauler and not sincerely collaborate on such efficiencies. Right now, each Athens truck operating within the city is making a roughly 40 mile trip to Sun Valley when daily operations are done to expect that to remain the case in perpetuity rather than a location here in Thousand Oaks that is appropriately designed makes no sense. Staff's recommendation in their report lay out very effectively why Athens should be granted this permit. I applaud city staff for their fair and thorough evaluation in this matter and hope that all of you recognize the sense and necessity of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions of the speaker? All right, moving along to Juan Rodriguez followed by Jennifer McCormick and Trevor Zierhut. Mr. Rodriguez, good evening. Good evening, I'm here on behalf of Athens and I have no further comments here for questions in case asked. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up then will be Jennifer McCormick, uh, Trevor Zierhut and Adam Haverstock. Ms. McCormick, are you with us? Ms. McCormick is not online. All right, moving on then, Trevor Zierhut. Adam Haverstock, and then Mark Innocenzi. Um, uh, Mr. Zierhut. Yes, uh, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Trevor Zierhut. I'm a Thousand Oaks resident, uh, speaking today in support of Athens Services uh, proposed truck dispatch center on Conejo Center Drive. Um, aside from uh, knowing a couple people who work with uh, Athens, I don't have any affiliation with the company or the, uh, um, yeah, or, or, or waste management. Uh, the, this project is a good and necessary one and it's consistent with the zoning designation as well as operational needs of Athens services. 
allowing the city's approved uh, waste manager or waste hauler uh, to site and facilitate uh, to park, maintain, wash, and repair their vehicles is essential for a level of service that the residents of Thousand Oaks deserve. And it's a major, uh, serv uh, as a major service provider. A thorough review of this proposed project has been done and is clear that the facility will not result in any traffic, air quality, water quality, or noise impacts. This determination is what city staff recommends the pro for the project's approval. As I've stated before, this project's path to approval has only been complicated by efforts of the previous hauler to unfairly burden the process with unfounded allegations and un unsubstantiated claims. This tactic only serves to threaten the most efficient and effective level of service for all Thousand Oaks residents. Please consider approving staff's recommendations and let's do all we can to work in good faith with Athens Services and maintain a healthy collaborative relationship uh, through the life of this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? All right, we move on to Adam Haverstock, Mark Innocenzi, and Gary Gagliardi. Good evening, Mr. Haverstock. Good evening, Chair Newman and Planning Commissioners. My name is Adam Haverstock. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Tourism for the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber of Commerce. For the record, I'm a resident of Fort Worth, Texas, but I was previously a 20-year resident of Moore Park. I'm here tonight to speak in support of the approval of the development permit for Athens Services to allow them to construct a truck storage facility in the Rancho Conejo area. Oh, and let me say for the record, both Waste Management and Athens Services are members of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce Executive Committee considered this development permit issue and decided to submit a letter last week in support of this item. I will briefly summarize our position. Number one, this project is an appropriate use of the M1 zoning. Number two, this project is compatible with neighboring uses, which are also industrial. Number three, this project is beneficial to the environment because it will not require Athens trucks to drive out of the city to Sun Valley every day and increase VMTs. And number four, this project will, for the same reasons, have a positive impact on traffic. Athens Services is trying to do their part to provide a high quality service for the residents and businesses of Thousand Oaks. The Chamber of Commerce recommends you approve this permit. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I've just been handed a note that Jennifer McCormick is online. Ms. McCormick, are you with us? Apologies, Chair. She did log on briefly and has since dropped off. Okay, we'll come back. <laughs> Next up then would be Mark Innocenzi, followed by Gary Gagliardi and Matthew Trouts. Mr. Innocenzi, good evening. Good evening, esteemed commissioners. My name is Mark Innocenzi. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks. I also have a small business here. Both my residents and my small business are very close to the proposed site. Um, prior to this, I lived in Orange County. I lived very close to a very similar maintenance site that was allowed to be close by our residential neighborhood. And there were impacts of noise, of odor, and traffic. There's going to be these impacts. Now the question is how severe, how will they be detected, and how will they will be mitigated? Commissioner Larson, Commissioner McMahon had very good comments appropriate to this. So there's some questions that have been submitted in Appendix 15. In addition to Mr. Kyle's questions, which were very good, there's some good questions about these issues. I did not see answers to these questions. I was at the March 24th hearing. I did speak. I made the same comments about the, the impacts. So with respect to this, this site is 1,000 feet away from residential. All right, um, just to address odor. Okay, we've heard that uh, trucks won't be there overnight storing garbage. Uh, it sounds like there may be roll-off bins there storing garbage. Um, what happens if a truck breaks down, and I, you know, I discussed this last time, and it's towed to the site full of garbage? There's going to be odor. Okay, when the wind blows, okay, the, the odor is going to be carried. There's also a school for uh, autistic kids, Passageway, that's on Lawrence. It's close by here. Okay, that's going to impact the kids. In Orange County, there was an elementary school that was impacted by the facility they put in. All right, you're going to have additional traffic. Uh, we heard last time there's going to be 42 trucks and 84 trips. Now it's 194 trips. Okay. Um, how, how are these things going to be monitored? We just heard that there really wasn't any monitoring mechanism. There isn't going to be random inspections to see whether actually trash is there. 
uh, how, how, how is the traffic going to be impacted? How is this going to be monitored? What are the enforcement mechanisms? I didn't really hear anything about any enforcement mechanisms. Okay, so these things are worrisome. Okay, and with respect to the noise, we have a 20-hour operation going from 4 a.m. to 12 a.m. Okay, and you have uh, the Arroyoville Apartments and also the Rancho Conejo um, housing f uh, establishment where I live. Okay, very close by this. Okay, 1,000 feet away. Okay, th there's, there's, there's going to be noise. And, and how, are, how are these things um, going to be handled? All right. Um, the other concerning thing is, is that I, I see things uh, on nextdoor.com. I, I see um, articles in the Acorn regarding various things that are happening with respect to Athens in the first four months. Uh, trash being picked up before 7 a.m. and after 7 p.m., a mixing of trash. Okay, these, these are things that have been being discussed publicly. Um, so I'm concerned about how this facility is going to run and when it's, uh, when it's ultimately in use, what's going to happen to the adjacent residents and the businesses that are close by here. Uh, there needs to be some way to detect and there has to be some kind of enforcement of these things that are going to negatively impact the people around it. Otherwise, the businesses and the residents that are close by are going to end up holding the bag and it's going to be a bad situation. I've already experienced this. All right, so th th those are my concerns and I hope that there will be some, maybe some additional answers to the questions that were submitted and some way to handle these situations. Maybe random inspections to see the trash is not there uh, and, you know, just things like that because Otherwise, we're going to be impacted, all the people that are close by. And I understand that th these types of facilities are necessary, um, but it w I've, I think it would be better for everybody if such a facility were located much further away from residential in some area where these uh, obvious concerns and issues are not going to impact the people close by, especially residential property and far away from any schools. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Mr. Gagliardi. And um, staff and the applicant and the appellant will have a chance to respond to comments and questions. Moving, moving along, um, we'll hear from Gary Gagliardi, followed by Matthew Trouts and Patrick Collins. Mr. Gagliardi, good evening. Good evening, thank you. Uh, my name is Gary Gagliardi. I'm a resident of Newberry Park. I have no financial ties to either party. I do have a very unique perspective because I am an owner of one of the adjacent properties um, that Ms. Lynch so eloquently pointed out is not as pretty as the site is being built and that's at 2612 Canal Center Drive. I also own a property at Lavery Court and I'm the president of the Lavery Court Owners Association um, and I'm also on the board for our association at Canal Center Drive. Those two properties are condominium complexes which enabled someone like myself who worked hard and saved their money to be able to buy an industrial piece of property for a very reasonable price. The problem at the 2612 site is it's a very heavily traveled area. I don't know what anybody's talking about. There's not traffic. It's a blind corner coming out of that facility. You've got the Amazon trucks that are coming through at very high rates of speed. In fact, we've had many near misses. We've had to call the uh, the uh, traffic division many times and having a truck making a right hand turn out of that hillside is going to create a bit of a hazard there. My other concern is while the trucks may not be storing waste overnight, the inside of those trucks are not crystal clean. And when they sit there from a Saturday night through a Sunday when it's 104 degrees out, let's say during the summer baking because there's no shade and my property's downwind, what am I supposed to do? I use my property every day. In fact, my 2612 property is actually a private gym for myself and my wife who's a breast cancer survivor. So we're there every day and we see what goes on there. It's actually a wonderful area. We've got hawks that fly through. There's lots of uh, wildlife that travel around behind us. You've got lots of families with kids that go hiking around there. And the other thing that really concerns me is that whole area is becoming a hub of the biotech industry. If you've seen the articles that have been in the Acorn, there's been an explosion. You've got Takeda, you've got Capsita, you've got um, Alexandria's uh, turning buildings into biotech labs. Why in God's name would you put a trash depot, let's call it what it is, in the middle of a burgeoning biotech area 
that's just not going to attract more businesses in that area. The Lavery Court property, again, that uh, Mark is also uh, one, of my, one of the owners there, is also going to be affected because we have a hard enough time turning out onto Lawrence Drive as it is with the Amazon drivers, and it's only going to increase as the Blue Cross building has now become shuttered, and that parking lot that um, Amazon uses is now going to become fully used for all their delivery vehicles. So what I'd like to know is, first of all, my own personal experiences are at our Lavery Court property, our trash costs have gone up 53% since Athens has taken over. In fact, we're in an argument with them because they gave us extra bins that were not required. They're charging us more, and their claim is that waste management never raised our rates for years, which is, which is not true because I handle the negotiations with our management company every year with, with waste management. So that's not true. My home property, my waste bill went down $4. Actually, sorry, $4.36. So I don't see my 17% savings. And every time Athens comes through, I've got to clean up in front of my street because they use these front loader trucks and they load four or five houses of recycling um, products. Then they dump it in and half of that stuff blows out because I'm in Dos Vientos and it's very windy. So I've got to go out and clean up my street. I'd also like to know where are they going to park their street sweeping vehicles? That's not been mentioned. Are they going to be parked on that facility as well? So. I think more information needs to be studied, and I really hope that you decide not to do this because I really think it's gonna infect some of the, uh, the biotech companies that are gonna come in there and a lot of us property owners. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Any questions of this speaker? Journeyman. Commissioner Buzz. Just is, real quick. Mr. Are, is the, sir, is your residential home on Lavery Court? So, sir, if you if you could speak at the, we're on TV as well. I'm sorry. I live in Dos Fientos. My I, Lavery Court is another industrial property that I own. It's also a condominium complex, so we're all individual owners. I'm the president of the board of that. Oh, okay. Association. I understood. Right. I understood condom right. Okay. And I then I own the 2612, which is on Caneo Center Drive. Copy that. Thank you. If I remember right, I one, think that was a Mr. project. Mr. Gagliardi, one more. <laughs> sorry. One more question. <laughs> You have, you, have a, a gym you have a gym over there and you have one here as well. Yeah, yeah I, you, I guarantee you're going to get your steps in today. Uh, I just had one question for you. Sure. If not here, where? I'm sorry, what? If not here, where? Uh, as Mark stated, I think um, there's probably um, a, better a better site, um, either farther, farther away from the residential sites, or, um, back towards maybe where the city has their uh, hazardous waste collection area back there. It might be a better, it might, puts it farther away. And to answer to Mr. Lanson's question, my, uh, my, my office is in Simi Valley. We're literally right down the street from Waste Management, and that's where, where their trucks dispatch out of them because I see them every morning. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. Gagliardi? Going, going. Thank Go you, on. sir. Thanks. Right. <laughs> okay, next we have uh, Matthew Trouts, followed by Patrick Cowles, followed by Jennifer McCormick. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me up here. My name is Matthew Trouts. I am a 30-year uh, Conejo Valley resident, current Lancer, live right by the high school. I also have the pleasure of working for Athens Services. Um, I'm really proud of that, guys. We're a family-owned company, and I can speak to um, the character of who we are. Um, I've been with the company for a long time. We are an extremely well-intended company with this yard. Specifically, I feel like we're going to be bringing environmental service jobs to our community. And there's also going to be construction jobs brought to our community through this project. And I think it's just another great example of Athens committing to Thousand Oaks. Um, since January 1st, we've been really uh, giving it our all up here. Um, we've been hearing some of the, you know, the, the, the thoughts about what's going on. But realistically, guys, um, we've um, done the best job that you could possibly do rolling out this transition. And again, this is just a further commitment of Athens services here in Thousand Oaks. Um, you know, I've got kids that are at that age and, you know, they're looking for jobs, they're in construction and things like that. And to have yet another um, facility being built by a great company in our hometown is just the best news ever. And then the long-term jobs that go with it. Environmental service jobs are very important and they shouldn't be discounted. Um, just because our guys wear blues and maybe they're not doctors and nurses doesn't mean they don't have a lot of value in families that they're trying to support. So um, with that, I say thank you for your time tonight. And again, I'm real proud to be with Athens, and I'm real proud to be a Lancer. So, 
Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Cowles. I realize Commissioner Lanson asked some of your questions earlier, but we want to make sure you have a. Um, hi, my name is Patrick Coles. I'm a resident of Newberry Park. I also own a business. It's underneath the hill where they're going to be um, building that facility. If you look at the map there, there's a U shaped building underneath where they're building. I'm directly below them. Okay. Um, to start off with, our trash rates went up 50. 55%, something like that, somewhere in there. So we're not saving money on our building. Um, I've been overcharged at my house by Athens. So I'm not really seeing a thing there. And they gave me the wrong garbage can. I got this little tiny yard waste bin and I'm on over a quarter acre. So that's not working. Um, I just have a lot of questions. Um, one of those, and probably the first one is, oversight when you say that you're the gentleman over here said that they would not be checking to make sure that they're not leaving trash overnight that to me is a big red flag why are you not checking um you know being in my building i have an interesting perspective i'm directly across the street from an amazon parking lot there's 500 trucks there okay give or take and um you know we have ups down the street all their employees are there. There's a lot of collisions at Lawrence and Corporate Center, okay? It happens all the time. Uh, right across the street from us, people come down that hill. I mean, they've had to pull people out of cars in that intersection with jaws of life and an 80,000 pound trash truck coming down that hill from a maintenance yard that's having a problem. I'm worried about that, okay? When they say that there's uh, not gonna be any hazardous material, it's a maintenance yard. I'm a repair shop, Moe's Smog, okay? We've been in business in this town for tw over 20 years, okay? Every maintenance yard has hazardous materials. You cannot do maintenance without oil, brake cleaner, brake pads, carburetor cleaner, okay? Uh, I, what is the action for those things when you say that there's not going to be hazardous materials i'm not buying it okay as a repair shop i know that there are hazardous materials also there if it's a maintenance yard and they're going to be cleaning their trucks what happens to that runoff water is there a clarifier there i had saw nothing about a clarification system for collecting water that's running off those trucks especially considering that the inside of those trucks is going to be very dirty um, we have a lot of local animals around us and I go into my shop sometimes 5.30 in the morning because I like to go hiking behind my shop and I see coyotes, hawks, rabbits, lizards. I mean, I see all kinds of animals there. Since they put that fence up, I haven't seen any rabbits in the back of my building. It's a little unnerving, you know. Um, so just for me, I... I I have questions, you know, also my customers, there's some pretty high-end cars in this neighborhood and debris and dirt from building, um, the stuff that flies down there for my customers, you know, I, I, I'm concerned for that as well. So I, I don't know if this is the site or not, um, but those are my questions and I, again, as other people have said, I think there's probably a better location in this town, especially they already have a place where they have all their trash cans. Why isn't that not an option? So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Coles. Other questions for you? Thank you again, sir. And we'll try one more time with Jennifer McCormick. And I'm seeing shaking of heads. Okay. We'll go back to staff then for follow-up comments. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Heher. So tonight we heard a, a variety of comments on this project. I think first I wanna make sure that we're clear that tonight's review is about this specific project. It's not about the franchise agreement. And I, 
do want to clarify that the comment that this franchise agreement and this particular project somehow muddled is not accurate. These are clearly separate projects. When the franchise agreement was awarded, it was awarded based on factors for the RFP, the request for proposals. And the proposals were submitted from the various players and the analysis was done based on those proposals received. This project was not part of that. It was not required. It was not crucial to the award of the franchise. It was not anticipated. It was not discussed in the franchise discussions for that night. So based upon that, there's no connection, a reasonable connection that would require this project be considered along with the franchise project, two separate projects. And so when you go and you look at a project, you look at what type of SQL analysis is being done. As reported by staff and, and various comments you heard from um, Athens attorney tonight, uh, there was a significant SQL review. And based upon that review, they, the decision was made to go to a exemption under 32, class 32. All right. And that's important because the person who walked that site is the one who's making these findings to make a decision whether or not the, exception, the exemption in class 32, all those five elements could be met. And based upon all that work, all five factors or, or elements of class 32 were found to be met. And then based upon that, that was the recommendation. Now, when you heard the appeal, there was a request for the exception to the exemption, and that is in 15300.2 subdivision C or subsection C. Now, it's important to note that that burden for that subsection is on the person who is saying that the exemption 32 does not apply. In 2015, there was a case, City of Berkeley, ver I'm sorry, it is Berkeley Hillside Preservation versus City of Berkeley. And it's important to note that case because it was a California Supreme Court case. And when it came down, everybody talked about it that has to do with CEQA because it was finally dealing with this exception to the exemptions issue, right? And in that case, one of the first comments was, for the application of unusual circumstances, which is what subsection C is about, the exception is not satisfied by a mere reasonable possibility that an activity will have a significant effect on the environment. You need to show, again, the unusual. It must be due to unusual circumstances. And when you look at this, the, this case, the two factors that waste management and their appeal used was the fire zone. That was one of them. And as we heard from staff and from uh, the various um, information that's in the staff report, that was analyzed. But many, many projects that we have in the city are going to be subject to that same zone. So it's not unusual that we have to look at that issue. That is not an unusual circumstance for this project because ev uh, many projects have to go through that analysis. One way to look at this is that some aspect of the, this specific project is so unusual that it is wholly distinguishable from all others in the exempt class. We don't have that situation here, and they have not established any factors to show that, to demonstrate based on their burden of proof to meet that element. That is a very important fact. It's not muddled to me. It is very clear that these two cases are separate issues and that the exemption, the factors in the exemption have been met by walking on the site, by doing the analysis of the VMT, all those things have been met. The consistency with the general plan, we met all of them. We would not recommend that exemption unless we found that it could be met. And what would be very important about that, it's, we did a CEQA analysis carefully to make sure, can we meet an exemption? And the answer is yes, we could, and we could support that based on all this eff effort and all this work that was done. Not based on a mere possibility, not based on it's possible that something could exist on this site. The fact is that someone walked the site, a biologist, a consultant, it was peer reviewed, and that was done to ensure that that element could be met, and it was.
Thank you. Ms. Kendall, are there any other? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not Hager? done yet. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, sir. <laughs> there was a discussion about substantial, right? What does that mean? And and to the waste management attorney's point, that's, she made a great point. It's, it's very hard to find case law that says this is what it is. But I will draw your attention to exhibit three of the staff report. And in that exhibit, you show the various uses around this building, these urban uses. You have a professional condominium complex on the northwest. You have various buildings on the north. You have various buildings on uh, the east. And you have various buildings on the south. You have a small portion of the west. Again, we've got to remember that that condo complex that's in the northwest has to have a 100-foot fire um, uh, protection area. So you, you have to count that out as, as something that's going to be cleared every year. So, so to me, looking at all that information, all that urban use, that means to me, my, my, in my opinion, that is showing a substantial urban area because most of the area around this place is surrounded by urban uses. You heard some comments tonight about concerns about the, the prices that people are paying and, and the, the effort that's being made by Athens and the current service. Again, that is about the franchise agreement. That is not about this project. I want to make sure that we're all clear that tonight it's about the appeal of the administrative hearing approving this project. It's not about Athens as a franchise operator. It's not about the lawsuits between Athens and waste management and the city is involved in and a couple of those, those are on appeal. It's not about that. It's about do we meet the necessary requirements for this application to make the recommendation that we made? And based upon all those factors, including the CEQA one, we find that we can recommend the exemption we believe that based upon all the information we received, waste management has not established in the burden of proof the exception under 15300.2C to the exemption. And based upon that, the recommendation that um, the planner has made earlier is the one that we are um, recommending to you. And I'm sure there's other comments from planners uh, on the dais here. Thank you, Ms. Kendall. Others? Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kathy Naum, Transportation Planner, Public Works. Thank you for letting me go first. A uh, couple, couple traffic questions were raised, so I'm just going to just let you know what, what I know so I can with you. The, there was a question that came up about, um, well, does the city monitor the number of trucks that are going to be using the, the road? The answer is no, we don't monitor them from, we'll say from the city of Public Works standpoint. The public monitors for it. A good example is there's um, a lot of Amazon trucks out there on Canary Spectrum. And um, so city staff went out and did traffic volume and traffic speed counts in 2019, which that data has been included in um, part of the documents you have. And it was determined that the, the what we call the 85th percentile, the speed that 85% of the people are driving at on the road, the Canary Spectrum, is, was at 28 um, miles an hour. So it was, you know, there was there's perception that that there's there's a lot of speeding going out there, and some people do drive above that and below it, but that's what 85% of the people are driving at. And we looked at, um, we had the volumes for what was people were driving in 2019, which has actually turned out to be good data because if it was, you know, since 2019, there's really not good data out there. Everything's really a lot lower. And if you look at how many trips this project will add, it's a point. 8% additional number of vehicles on the road out there, and the road's mm -hmm. already at a level service A. So the feeling is that it's really, this project will not deteriorate the level service out there because it's such a low volume over the course of the day. And, oh, one other thing about collisions. Um, this had come up when, when it went to the, appeal, the, the administrative hearing, so I looked at the accident data, and there's no, been no reported collisions in the last five years in the surrounding intersections. So that's um, not to say some people might not see it, but based on our accident data that comes from the um, Thousand Oaks Police Department, there's no reported collision. So, thank you. And one more thing, uh, Chair, before Ms. Kindle speaks, and that is that we heard a number of comments about um, the condition reg regarding trash. And it is a condition in the recommended uh, conditions that are before you with a resolution. Um, it's a policy 
that in most circumstances for the City of Thousand Oaks, we are responsive to complaints when it comes to co-compliance. So if there is a complaint that we receive, we investigate that. So there might be periodic review of a person's property based on a violation that we are going through a case process on, uh, whether it's a civil or criminal. And an officer who's in charge of that case may go to that property numerous times to see if the conditions that are being, the nuisance for example, are being fixed or taken care of. But it's based on reporting parties who report that there is an issue and then we investigate that. That is how the conditions work and that's how our policy's been. So we do not do a, we have always inspections and, and, a, and a set time period of inspections. It's gotta be based on complaint based and um, that's how we handle co-compliance co issues and condition issues. I just have a, a few things to make more clear. Um, the site was graded in the mid 1990s. I believe there was a comment uh, made during one of the presentations that the site was graded very recently, uh, which is not the case. Um, there are a number of con conditions um, as were just described uh, related to nuisances, noise, odor, dust, and the on-site storage of waste. Um, all of those would be uh, subject to code enforcement. Um, and our conditions of approval, although they are very much not expected to become nuisances, uh, we don't expect there to be an issue, but if there is and there are reports of such issues, um, code enforcement will respond. Um, and I just wanted to make clear um, that the residential uses um, near the site are, uh, is, are part of a teacher academy. The, there are no residential uses within the normally required uh, notification radius. Um, other residential uses, uh, the, the next closest are, I think, somewhere around 2,000 uh, feet away. Um, I think the rest of the comments uh, can mostly be issued by the applicant, uh, including those around the truck wash, how often the trucks will be washed, uh, and how that um, facility cleans its water and things like that can be uh, discussed by the applicant. And we have other um, staff from the Department of Public Works here who can help answer questions about that as well. Very good, thank you. I'll ask the commission to hold hold comments for now. We're gonna to go to the ap appellant and the applicant and we will come back. Understood, and you'll have an opportunity to ask them, but I wanna make sure we get all comments out before um, we respond. It's also the order in the script. <laughs> cool. Always have something to point to. All right, we'll go, we'll go to the appellant next for any rebuttal comments, and you have a five-minute period for rebuttal. So, Ms. Lisey, we'll go back to you or any member of your team. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple brief points, since I know it's getting late and I wanna be sensitive to everybody's time. Um, with respect to this no value as habitat issue, that initially is the first criteria and the burden is on the city to prove in order to rely on the class 32 exemption. So the problem with the BRA survey that it was conducted only on one day in November when rare endangered plants do not bloom, usually protocol level surveys are all required to be done in the spring for that purpose. Um, according to our consultant who was only able to use aerials um, to show, he had looked at the site in October. It had vegetation at that time and, and you know, native and also non-native. But also when he looked again after this November survey in preparing the more recent comment letter in March, the site had been disturbed. So I'm not sure that because that vegetation wasn't there when um, I think staff alluded to that there hadn't been any grading since the 90s, I don't believe that that is accurate. So the BRA survey itself admits that it didn't do these protocol level surveys, which is required to prove that there's no value as habitat. Um, and it's, Plus, it's just not substantially surrounded by urban uses. I, I recognize there's this, a debate happening here, but 
again, on the face of the exemption, you can't say it's surrounded by urban uses. With respect to the NOx emissions from construction, you know, I didn't see it before because it's buried in the Cali Mod modeling, you know, um, spreadsheets that are just kicked out and, and included. There was no text or discussion as the form of an air quality analysis. Um, but to say that construction emissions are not required to be considered is just not accurate. In fact, the city just released a mitigated negative declaration in February for the Conejo Summit project that used the 25 pounds per day NOx threshold uh, that's been established by the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District and which is also required in order to obtain an authority to construct permit. So there's evidence in the record that shows that these construction threshold will be exceeded, which triggers the need for environmental review or, or so it should. Uh, with respect to this um, project being clearly separate and different from the franchise agreement, you know, with all due respect to the city attorney, we will agree to disagree and continue to. Um, I just felt compelled to acknowledge the fact that Athens had identified this site in 2020. They had made an offer to the school district in late 2020. They had completed their due diligence by their own attorney and counsel's admission for which we obtained only through the Public Records Act request after the fact. Um, but yet there was no information to the city council in March You know, at that time in fact, they represented to the council that the Santa Paula site would be immediately expanded for this very purpose before you tonight. So in litigating this issue and perhaps continuing to litigate this issue, um, if we prevail, the court could require Athens and the city to go back and actually look at totality of the environmental review, maybe impose you no know, mitigation measures, um, you know, mitigate significant impacts to the extent feasible. So this is exactly why the legislature in adopting CEQA has prohibited piecemealing in CEQA cases because you must consider the effects on the environment before you know, a project gains irreversible momentum and, and also to inform public decision making, um, which you know, the council was deprived of apparently you know, at that time. Uh, with respect to the Berkeley Hillside case, you know, with respect to the exception to the exemption, um, you know, there are unusual circumstances here with respect to the high fire hazard area, uh, with respect to the potential for biological resource impacts. So this is why, you know, the project could result in significant impacts. But the main point is just on its face in the language of the class 32 infill exemption uh, this project is not applicable or, or should not be relied upon uh, for approval with that stated purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lacey. We move now to the, not yet, one, one more round and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, does the applicant have any rebuttal comments? And if you do, you'll have five minutes to, to make your comments. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanna to respond to Mr. Innocenzi's comments. He had submitted four questions. I actually expressly responded to each one in writing as part of my May 2nd, 2022 letter. So those answers are all there, but very briefly, he asked why there's no express condition prohibiting trucks with waste from parking on site. Of course, as we've discussed, there is one. He also asked when trucks will be leaving the site in the morning to start their routes. As we previously discussed, uh, residential routes start at 7 a.m. Right now, commercial trucks um, uh, are dispatched around that same time or slightly earlier. Um, also, as laid out in the franchise agreement, all of the trucks return before 7 p.m. And so again, all of those details are in my response letter. Um, he had also asked specifically what type of truck operations occur on the site in the early hours of the morning. These are also um, laid out in my response letter and the application. Um, the activities that happen early in the morning are the arrival of truck driver employees, the fueling of trucks, the arrival of office employees, um, and the dispatch, of course, of trucks to their various routes. 
Finally, he had asked why the noise technical memorandum refer references a total of 84 truck trips, if only 42 trucks are necessary to serve the city. Um, to clarify, any time in the staff report, in the noise report, and the traffic memorandum, when we're talking about a truck trip, that's referring to a one-way truck trip. So if we have 42 trucks, there is one trip out and one trip back, and that equals 84 truck trips. So that's the, the difference that he uh, pointed out there. Um, there was a comment on a blind spot uh, when we turn out of our site. Again, that's why we are improving and widening that driveway. Unfortunately, that's also why we need to remove uh, tree number 77. So that's all related to providing a, a safe uh, merging area at the um, project entrance. Um, there were some questions about whether the street sweeper parks on this site. It does, and that is one of the trucks that is included in our truck count. Um, there was a comment about um, hazardous waste. So the question under the infill development uh, exemption and any of those exceptions that we're talking about, um, you cannot apply an exemption if you are on a designated hazardous waste site. So a Cortese site, of course we are not one of those. Uh, the question is not whether we're gonna have oil or brake fluid on the site. Um, I did have a few slides uh, from the administrative hearing regarding the clarifier and the truck wash. So the way that that works very quickly um, is a truck enters the truck wash, um, there is a drain underneath the truck wash, all of the truck wash water goes into that drain, there is a clarifier under the truck wash, um, the different sediments and oils and greases are, you know, sort of diffused out of each of these different containers and then ultimately that clarified water is sent into the sewer system. So there's no commingling of any of the water that comes out of the truck wash with any storm water on the site. Those are two completely separate systems. Uh, finally, to respond to um, a few of waste management's comments, she uh, is again requesting protocol level surveys of she claims that uh, her biologist somehow saw native plants from an aerial. Uh, I just don't think this is possible, and she doesn't cite to any law requiring protocol level surveys in order to apply this infill development exemption. Protocol level surveys are typically done when you already have found potential habitat on your site and you need to go into significant detail. Again, if you look at the project site photos um, in our biological resources assessment, you'll see that there is no need to do protocol level surveys here. Um, again, regarding the NOx threshold, um, I didn't mean to imply that we don't look at construction emissions at all. Uh, my point was that the threshold that waste management is citing in the appeal, well, in the additional letter she submitted today of 25 pounds per day of NOx expressly does not apply to construction emissions. So that's not the applicable threshold here. Um, finally, uh, I don't want to belabor the franchise agreement points any further, but we do lay out the dates um, in our original applicant response letter that uh, was attached to my May 2nd letter. So this is the April 16th letter that was submitted ahead of the administrative hearing. It lays out all of those dates, um, when uh, Athens Services gained control of the site, when escrow was open, when they began doing due diligence, um, and it just supports you know, what uh, your attorney, Patrick Keeher, had already laid out that these are completely separate projects um, and there was nothing before the city at the time of the franchise agreement that ties this project to that one. Um, finally, uh, I believe Commissioner um, Link had questioned if we do not park our trucks here, where are we going to park them? Um, and we just want to reiterate that parking our trucks on this site is the perfect opportunity to invest locally in Thousand Oaks, reduce Athens Services VMT impacts, and make use of an existing underutilized industrial zoned development pad that is nearly perfect for this use, given its location, topography, prior grading, and screening from the roadway. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I'll open it up for Commissioner, questions, comments? And Commissioner Buss, I think you had your hand up first. Let Five me just mark ago. everything real quick so I know who I'm asking what. Please. <laughs> um, I'll start with Athens, if, if that's okay with you. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, reducing the amount of vehicle miles traveled by your vehicles. I'm not super familiar with CNG, but um, what's your estimated uh, cost savings on this and emission savings? Do you have that? that? I don't believe we've modeled that, no. Okay, so no idea, no problem. All right, um, a number of people have asked where else, including one of the fellow commissioner. Um, did you um, look at any other prospective sites within the city and why was this one the best one? Would you care to share or? You know, that was before my involvement and it really doesn't 
relate to this project and the no application? Care to share. That's fine by me. Sure. Yeah, I'm just asking. All right. And uh, as far as uh, we were talking about uh, complaints about noise, f uh, storage, et, et cetera, who is the regulatory agency that oversees that? Would it be the city uh, responsible for that for complaints or do you, is there an overriding agency that, 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 that monitors this stuff? So the city would be responsible for responding to complaints about violations of the city's conditions of approval. So these are the city's conditions that we're agreeing to. All right, so it's us. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, I will, you know what, I'm gonna skip them. Uh, Steph, um, I was gonna ask um, if any of the neighbors had voiced any concerns. I did hear three, so I know of those. Were there any others that I'm unaware of? Sorry, are you asking if there were other? Other neighbors that have voiced uh, opposition to this or support? There were um, more comments made at the administrative uh, hearing. I'm not sure, there, I'd, have to, I'd have to cross check the list to see if there was anybody who spoke okay, at that meeting instead of this one. Nothing beyond what we saw in writing in our packet and the supplemental packet. Right. Okay. Yeah, you have all of the comments received. Perfect. In the project's lifetime. And then the other question I've got is, um, we're talking about obviously an area that's zoned for industrial use. My question is, has somebody mentioned there's a school for uh, um, people on the spectrum? Is that in, <laughs> within that industrial zone? So that's a great question because um, I caught the same thing and schools are not permitted in that one zone. Correct, so, uh, that's, so why, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> all right, so um, again, I'm not sure it's, it, <laughs> I'm hesitating because for this particular project tonight, I. I I'm not sure how much I could get into it other than to say is I'm not sure when they applied for their permit that they said that it was a school. I think people have referred to this place as a school. Um, it came up at a cannabis hearing for Legendary yes. when they said that it was just over 600 feet away from a school. And of course, we were going, what school are you talking about? And then it uh, turns out that when I looked at the permit for that, if, if it's the same place, that it wasn't a permit for a school. Um, just one of those ones that... Uh, I think that's what he's referring to, but I didn't want to get into it too much other though I caught the same, I had the same okay. question. And then um, perhaps you can tell me, what is the actual physical distance from this location to the, I think the apartment complex over off of Rancho Canal is probably the closest. Does anybody have yeah, a- The road bill is about 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Yeah, that's so, so, so there, I, I, there are no residential neighborhoods within three football fields, right? No, there's not. Um, there's some faculty housing for the SDA um, school um, nearby, about a thousand thousand feet. Which, which school is this? The academy. Uh, it's oh, the, the, the Adventist yeah. academy. Other above, uh, yeah, the other side. The other side to the uh, west. That's still what it's called. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, I think that's all my questions for you guys. And uh, and then uh, just so I'm clear, uh, fire hazard issues keep coming up. Um, I'm aware that uh, there's a significant amount of biotech manufacturing going on there. So would it be reasonable to assume that the city is planned for the eventuality of a, of a fire incursion into that neck of the woods? That would be correct. We, we actually reviewed it in the last uh, episode that we had yeah. uh, because obviously we always have concerns making our process better, our evacuation issues, our safety issues better for every situation that we have, whether it's practice or the reality of it. Uh, we go through an analysis to see what we can do better, and that would include this area of the city. Because I'm just thinking, if I'm trying to park my business nearby, it might be safe to put it around several billion dollars worth of uh, uh, biotech manufacturing. They might right. protect that. Okay, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lanson. Okay, you took all my questions. So now I'm, I'm, I'm down to just Miss, Miss Lisi. I just had one question for you. Um, I think you indicated that um, waste management was looking at the same property to build, was, would it be the same kind of facility? I don't know where you got that information. We weren't, I don't believe ever looking at buying the same school district site. I, I interpreted some of your comments being that you were looking at the same kind of concepts. That's why I'm kind of verifying. Is that, that's not true then? Uh, how do you mean? Can you explain? Was waste management looking for any type of facility to park its trucks in the event they were able to get the contract? Oh, no. Um, the existing hauling and uh, storage facility is in Simi Valley, so they would have used the same facility. 
so they would just consider on, consider, you know, continue on with the same process in terms of the existing way that they were doing things? Correct. And, and, and again, I, I, again I, I'm a little bit confused uh, as Commissioner McMahon is, then, then why didn't Waste Management win the contract? Uh, I, you would probably have to ask the city council and staff that. It was a confidential RFP process, so I was not privy to all the back decision-making factors. Okay, I, I, that's, an, I, that's all. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I want to um, just follow up with Mr. Heher to be sure I understood a cautionary comment you, you made about the scope of this hearing tonight. If I understand correctly, um, we are here to review an appeal of a decision about the lot in Newbury Park, and, and that's all. We are not reviewing the franchise agreement. Is that, that is correct? absolutely correct. You are handling the appeal of the administrative hearing which approved the project, and therefore you are also taking action to approve the project along with the, um, not oak tree permit, but the protective tree permit. <laughs> so even if I were to say, and this is a hypothetical, but if I were to say, I'm really unhappy with Athens, my rate has gone up 375%, I think they're, I really don't like this at all. Um, this isn't the right place for that complaint. Is that, is, yeah, would that am, be am accurate? Right, and I wanna be clear that my comments were not saying that they didn't have value. It's for tonight's purposes. Um, the comments on the franchise or any, any of the discussion about the franchise issue is really um, not part of this other than the assertion that that franchise agreement was somehow related to this project and therefore should have been a total environmental analysis for the whole thing, which I, and we've all talked about numerous times already. Okay, Thank, thanks for that. I, I do have another question about what's in and out of scope within the appeal, but I'll, I'll come back to that. I wanna go to other commissioners, if they have comments for, or questions for I, Commissioner I no, Link. No questions, just comments. Um, are they comments directed at the appellant, the applicant, or staff? Uh, probably nothing that they could respond to. It would lead let's, into making a motion, so. Let's, let's hold that Unless for Commissioner once we Lance close the. Unless Commissioner wanted to take the motion. We haven't closed, the, we're still in a we're, public we're hearing. We're still in a public hearing, okay. okay. And we will have an opportunity to discuss this among ourselves, but that happens after we close the hearing. So I, I want to be sure you have a is chance that what the, to talk. Is that what the script says? I don't need to look at the script <laughs> to, to tell you that. Okay, so not hearing any other questions, I will, I will come back to staff. Um, again, just to follow up, Mr. Heher, within the scope of just the appeal itself, um, my understanding is we are reviewing a decision that was made administratively. There was a change since that decision to remove one condition that was not appropriate, condition formerly, the former condition 27. Um, as a matter of precedent, we try to not design from the dice, and that would take the form this evening of not trying to rethink what the administrative decision was, correct? We're not, we're not moving buildings around right. on this lot or you, things like that. C correct, this is a de novo hearing though, so you're listening to all the testimony, that's why we had to attach all the other documentation, yes. because you wanna make sure that you've, and we believe we've established this, that you have the entire record from the initial plans to the, um, to the administrative hearing, to all the comments from that, and then to, for the staff report for this meeting and all the comments from this meeting, all those factors are, are for your review. But the action for the recommendation is whether to approve the appeal or deny the appeal, make an action to approve the project, and approve the piece, the protected tree permit. I'm sorry, I'm slipping on that one because I'm used, so used to oak tree permit. But right. the protective tree Protect permit. PTP, yeah. And then finding the CEQA exemption of class 32, that is the recommendation before you from staff. Right, so again, this is a hypothetical, and if it were to come to pass, it's a hypothetical I would oppose, but let me ask it. If we look at this, this de novo case and say, you know, the, this building that's right here, we really don't like the location of this building. We want it to be in this other place. Is that in or out of scope for this appeal? 
Um, I'm just trying to I, understand what, what, what we are and aren't doing with this appeal. Yeah, I would say that uh, the, the project before you includes the locations for the, for the building and the parking lot based upon all the information that we had, and that would include the CEQA analysis. And so we are saying within the project site, so the project site is, is what's before you, that 4.4 acres um, plus the oak tree issue. Okay. For the record, I'm fine with the building location. That's okay. I'm, I'm raising that as an example to sure. what we can and can't ask here. And then my final question um, is for Ms. Naum <laughs> regarding uh, your traffic analysis. Um, you testified that um, in recent years there has not been a significant increase in traffic collisions in the area. I, th I think that's correct. Um, there was a public comment asserting that there have been more collisions at the specific intersection of Lawrence Drive and Caneo. And is that, does the city have statistics that do or don't support that assertion? So I, I looked at the statistics at the, for the administrative hearing. And at that point, I was prepared to talk about collision data. And there was no collisions in the immediate area at any of the intersections for the past five years. So although I don't have them here in front of me, that's from six weeks ago what I was prepared to talk about if we were talking about it. But uh, And again, these are reported collisions. Mm -hmm. So it's what if somebody has a collision and the police come out and, and, and take us, um, uh, and, you know, fill out all the paperwork. <laughs> And I'm sorry, I'm not sure I heard right. Did you say there are no collisions or no increase in collisions? No collisions. No collisions no reported. Zero. Reported. Correct. Right, okay. Thanks for that. Uh, Commissioner Buss had his hand up. Because you're asking this hypothetical, I actually have uh, the, the, um, the tree is not separate from the actual appeal, correct? It, we're voting one time or are we voting twice? No, you're voting one time. Uh, is this at the... So my only question is, is how did it end up in administrative review before it came to us if the tree sure. is a package deal? Was that sure. added on later? Or I think Mr. Deal? Kearns can answer that specifically, um, and he did address it a little bit, but to be, let's clear it for the record for you. Yeah, in the first evaluation, when the application was submitted, there was no impacts to any oak tree on the site. And then when they started going through the engineering drawings, they discovered that the, there could be encroachments on that oak tree, oak tree number 77. So at that point, um, the hearing officer made a decision to at a condition that if there were in fact no alternative designs that would avoid impacts of that tree, um, then they would have to file the P2P and Planning Commission would then look at, look at that. Lots of commissioners sh shaking their heads saying they're, we're all good. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up for commissioner comments or a motion. Commissioner Link. Again, not to beat a dead horse, but based on Mr. Heher's determination, my own assessment of the two aspects that came before us and the allegation more or less re with regard to piecemealing, I myself find that uh, the two aspects are separate and distinct. And while they may have been complicated, certainly from a pure business case, and, and certainly it would be in Athens' best interest to have a site that is located within the city of Thousand Oaks, so I, frankly, it's just good, good business. I don't think that any piecemealing occurred here. Uh, so going on that same vein, I think the categorical exemption based on Section 32 is reasonable and that the appellant didn't necessarily meet their burden of proof with that regard, and uh, keeping in mind that this is in regard to endangered or threatened species. So we do live in the Conejo Valley, and uh, the rabbits don't fall under that category. There are a lot of them, and I do not believe that they are an endangered species. So uh, while I do recognize that the loss of a rabbit running through your backyard is certainly disconcerting, it does not fall within the scope of CEQA. Uh, VMT, similarly, I do believe is a non-issue, both from the categorical exemption screening criteria standpoint, and from the standpoint that the technical guidance recognizes that this is a net increase. So keeping these two things separate, you could argue that there is a net decrease in VMT as a result of Athens' current operations now being reduced to the amount of, or the length of trips by delivering to Simi Valley or tipping wherever they tip uh, and locating their trucks here in town. Now, I, I did find it interesting that uh, it, 
trips are generally from point A to point B, and a circuitous trip is generally considered one trip. So I'm kind of surprised that it was double counted uh, as, as a, a, a circular trip was counted as twice. So in my estimation, that would actually be double counting of trips, but that's neither here nor there. And again, the guidance is, uh, from OPR uh, with regard to VMT and, and even with level of service prior to that is that the lead agency, this again being the City of Thousand Oaks, gets to establish their thresholds. And the 100 p.m. peak hour trip threshold for the City of Thousand Oaks has been longstanding and certainly has been tested. So I don't find that there is really any uh, way of impugning that. I'm sure we'll find out later, maybe, perhaps. Uh, I, I do recognize the concerns that the neighbors have with regard to noise and odors uh, and that there are probably other locations for this. Unfortunately, Athens doesn't own those locations and we can't compel Athens to purchase another piece of property. So we just have to consider what's in front of us. So, uh, and I'm sure they looked. Uh, I'm sure they tried to look for something that was uh, obviously in their best interests uh, and, and this is the one that they, uh, they arrived at. So that said, uh, I would move that uh, we adopt a resolution finding that the project is categorically exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to section 15332, denying an appeal of development permit DP 2021-70408, and approve a protected tree permit PTP 2022-70370. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner McMahon. <clears throat> Commissioner Link has, uh said a lot <laughs> and I, I, he said it a lot better than I could say it I will just um, comment that I did walk the site I, I guess I trespassed um, and I was up there and I, I walked a lot of it and saw just dirt and it was up high and it was surrounded by industrial buildings and I thought to myself that if you want to put a lot of trucks kind of out of the way where it's not going to bother any people in houses, this was probably the place. So based on what Commissioner Linka said and, and my own uh, walking of the property, I will support the motion. Very good. Commissioner Lanson. Thank you, Chair Newman. Uh, I look at our position on the Planning Commission uh, as very limited in some sense. Uh, we are not the city council. We have five amazing people on the city council and they dictate in terms of the city plan and various other things. So the comment with regard to, you know, why would you want to put this by biotech? That's, that's beyond our purview. We are a planning commission that is an executive body that's there to enforce the rules and regulations. Uh, in terms of enforcement, if they're overcharging, if they're um, doing various other things that were, that were stated by members of our, our community, which by the way, I took with a lot more weight <laughs> than I did with regard to what waste management said. Those are all important issues, but again, those go uh, to issues above and beyond what I think the Planning Commission can address. Those are either enforcement issues by code enforcement or by the, the City Council, to the extent you wanna change the zoning to prohibit within 2,000 feet. That's again, that's not the current code. We can't all of a sudden make new law by extending some of these protections in ways that we're not authorized to do. We'd be making law. And again, you didn't elect us. <laughs> we are planning commissioners. We are not elected officials. Uh, so I put all of those comments in that area. As to the appeal, I, I'm, I, it, it's, it's frustrating because I can see that so many things were thrown at the wall with basically duct tape um, to rely upon alleged aerial photographs to uh, rely upon hearsay things without necessary information to basically just say, of course it's a protected area for animals without really any evidence aside from just saying, of course it is. Uh, th that to me is, is just amazing that we had to actually go through that process. So I found no weight whatsoever in the appeal. Um, I think the arguments, uh, and, and again, Commissioner Link did a fantastic job of going through them, uh, were of no weight for me. Again, I took a lot more weight in the, in the, the comments from our community. So I will support the motion. Very good. Commissioner Buss. Uh, I think everybody's pretty much uh, covered it very succinctly, but uh, I, will, I will agree with uh, both Mr. Link's assessment and Mr. Lance's assessment and uh, Chair McMahon, or uh, Ms. McMahon's assessment. Lots of promotions tonight. I know, I'm all over it. Sorry <laughs> about that. But um, most importantly, um, I, I don't understand why waste management is appealing this. And I think that a significant amount of time 
by this body was spent, by our staff, by uh, the Athens team, and, and I, I ultimately don't understand why. And uh, I find it very frustrating that we have to be here tonight to do that as a private citizen and a resident of this town. And, um, uh, but we'll move along. Uh, I must say that uh, this maintenance yard would be a heck of a maintenance yard to work in. I know that uh, she said it wasn't, uh, that it was re referred to not as an urban environment, but uh, it seems like a very pleasant urban environment to me. Uh, I worked in the San Fernando Valley for 20 years, uh, right off of a freeway, so much, much, much less scenic. So uh, with that, I, I too will give my support to it. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, there's not much to be said beyond what the other commissioners have, have already said. Um, I'm with Commissioner Lansing on giving the greatest weight to members of the public who spoke both for and against uh, in, in support and, and against this appeal. Um, I'm very sympathetic with their comments, but I also concur with Commissioner Lansing that some of the comments here are just out of scope for what we can and can't do tonight. Um, if you're not happy with the service provided with Athens, there are other avenues within the city, such as code compliance, where you can take up those issues. But the question before us tonight is a very narrow one, and that's namely whether a previous administration administrative decision was correctly decided. That's all. That's all we're here to decide. And the arguments, in my mind, that were made against that decision were not compelling and were not evidence-backed. Um, I won't go quite as far as Commissioner Lanson, who you just used the terms alleged aerial photos. I think the photos probably existed. Um, whether they provided sufficient evidence to make a determination that there was some problem with this decision, that, that I think, is a, is a matter for debate. And I concur about the resolution of aerial photography that's av available to civilians, that it's just not very detailed and certainly not detailed enough to reverse a decision. Um, I agree as well that the city does have the authority to make decisions about VMTs. The 100 VMT threshold is longstanding and has been upheld many, many times. And we are well below that threshold here. And because we have not heard sufficient evidence to challenge the decision, I too will support it. I'm not gonna go into questions about motives of either the appellant or the applicant. I think that's out of scope. The question before us was whether the decision that was previously made administratively was correct. And I've not heard a preponderance of evidence tonight to suggest that it was not. So therefore, I will support this decision and I will ask the clerk to prepare us for a vote. Commissioner Buss? Aye. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Ling? Aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Chair Newman? Aye. <laughs> okay. Motion carries 5-0. Any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. I want to ask, I want to thank representatives, both of the appellant and the applicant for appearing tonight and to the many members of staff who participated in this case previously. We'll move on to department reports. Mr. Duggan, I believe we have none. Okay, not hearing department reports, we'll go to commissioner comments. Commissioners? Okay, I have, I have a couple of comments. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Buss. All right, while you're preparing yours, I'll make my comments. Um, we have an election coming up, a primary election on June 7th, and I will connect this to land use in just a moment. Um, but first, a civic, a, a civic reminder, um, every voter in Thousand Oaks is getting a mail-in ballot. They went out starting yesterday, and the city, the, the county clerk recorder, who is responsible for all elections, has asked that anyone who has not received a ballot by this Friday, let them know about it. 
and the clerk's phone number is 805-654-2664. 805-654-2664. Two six six four. if you have not received a mail-in ballot by this Friday. Now, the land use part of that, I'm sure that all of you have seen driving around town, there are lots and lots of political campaign signs. And I applaud everyone for being civically engaged in our electoral process. I do not applaud anyone who is violating our city law by placing campaign signs on open space or on public rights of way. That is not and never is legal. And if you see a sign like that, you're not allowed to take it down yourself, but you should call our city's public works department who will go out and take down those illegal signs. And the number to call for that is public works is 805-449-2400. Thus endeth my public service announcement. Mm -hmm. Mr. Buzz. I just wanted to reach out to everybody and acknowledge the fact that uh, the city of Thousand Oaks has put up a survey on uh, their website regarding uh, bike lanes and sidewalks along Lynn Road and Hillcrest Drive. Um, they're looking for public input on that and I think it's a very important issue in our town to create greater accessibility and uh, how we do it is going to be determined by community input to some degree. So I'd, I'd like everybody to try to get to the Thousand Oaks City website and uh, please fill out that survey. Let the city know what, what, what your opinion is because, you know, beyond voting, this is, this is when, uh, when our voices are heard and when we get to tell people what matters. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? All right, Mr. Dugan, are there any follow-up items, announcements, and upcoming issues? Yes, Mr. Chairman, there are a couple. Um, concerning uh, issues coming up at City Council on May 24th, there are several contracts for community development on the consent calendar, and there will be a department report regarding initiating an SB 9 ordinance, which we've all been waiting for. Also concerning the Planning Commission meetings coming up, um, there will be Planning Commission meetings. Um, on May 23rd, the Planning Commission will be hearing a departmental report on the 2021 general plan and the Housing Element Annual Progress Report. And also there will be a public hearing on a request for a mixed use of multifamily residential development at 325 and 391 Hampshire Road, formerly known as the Kmart site. Then on June 13th, the next Planning Commission meeting, there are two items on the tentative schedule a public hearing regarding adding cannabis retailer as an adult use as a permitted retail operation in the M1 zone, and a public hearing on a request to construct a four multifamily residential buildings and related uses at one Baxter Way. So several big hearings coming up. We have a busy schedule ahead. All right, not hearing any other comments. I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting, and we're now adjourned until our next meeting. May 23rd, 2022. Good night, Thousand Oaks.